Okay, so this is uh, John Rob here with Marco. You're still in Derbyshire waiting for the pandemic to end. Yeah, so I can, I can get back to um, the real world. <laughs> <laughs> and have you been busy? Have you been creative? You've got all the guitars um, out there in the room. So have you, have you actually, do you actually play them or you just hang them on the wall? No, I play them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so have you been writing a lot? I haven't been, do- I haven't been doing anything. I haven't yet opened up because... No one's been at because I, I I found it sort of po- pointless just writing on your own. It gets really you get to this big wall. I have been writing things, but then no, nothing's finished. You know, they're sort of done with a view of playing them to somebody else one day. But no one's really doing anything, as I'm sure you know, because there's nothing to do. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of sitting around or sending files around. A few people have been doing that, but it's not. Quite- no, I've been I've been sending files around. People have been sending me files. Hmm. Yeah, because it's not, not the same as really, you know. Because it's all right. It's all right. But it's it's great. It's really useful for like getting the start of an idea. But I really want to be, you know, in the room with somebody else to finish it off. Yeah, I've always thought of you. It, it's not a conversation, is it? It's just they send you one thing. You put something on it. You they they go, oh yeah, this is great. I've edited it. They send it back to you. You put something else on it. You edit it back to the way it was. And it's just, it's it's not it's not it's not an it's not an interchange, is it? It's not it's not a conversation, is it? Yeah, I've always I've always kind of seen you as a collaborative artist. You've always yeah. met lots of different people, yeah. lots of different projects, and yeah. is is that the way you prefer to work? Yeah, definitely, definitely. But I've got to meet the person, you know. So do you, so when you're writing with that person, do you kind of play off their personality a bit as well? You know, yeah. their energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they they come up obviously they're a different person, so they're going to come up come up with things that you would never come up with. That's the great thing about collaboration. You you learn everything. You know, every, you, you learn you learn something every time. It may not be something you wanted to learn, but it's. <laughs> it's <laughs> but and it's but a two way. That's how you grow. Otherwise, you you just don't grow. Just sitting here in this in my studio doing sod all you know and that's a two-way process as well isn't it because they have to meet you kind of somewhere halfway yeah yeah and it's supposed to you know the sum the sum of the parts is greater than the individual thing you know mm-hmm. that idea i mean that's the, the way- idea of a band isn't it otherwise people just do it on their own so in those kind of situations, are you generally the instigator of the idea or are you no, the person? No, always. I mean, it's, I do instigate ideas, but I never know what they are. Or I never know if they're any good. It's like I'm very good with other people's stuff. I can sort of like judge it and make uh, make um, make suggestions. With my, my own stuff, I'm just sort of like thinking, oh, is this any good? Should I play it to anybody? What is it? I don't know what it is. And... Sometimes you pay it to bit and they go, oh, I know what that is. And it's not what you thought it was going to be. So I, I don't make yeah. any, I, I used to say, well, I think this is the verse and this is the chorus. And then they go, no, it isn't. And <laughs> <laughs> so I never say anything. I just say, you know, I just deliver it. And then you you tell me what you think. Yeah. So, so, so it's kind of not half finished, but something you leave it open-ended. It's, it's, it's the, the beginnings of an idea. Mm-hmm. It's the beginnings of an, idea, of an idea, and then it can go somewhere else. I did it. Sometimes, did they... sometimes, it's that, sometimes it's so brilliant that you can't you can't improve it. Mm. That, that, those are good days then, when it arrives <laughs> ready formed. <laughs> yeah, they, a few a few and far between. Maybe once every ten years. And, is it, and also, does this work the other way around? As people send you ideas, and you finish them off for them and send them yeah, back. Yeah, 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 yeah. I find that I find that um, it's not always. I, I kind of like doing it because I, I just immediately get and I usually I get them if it's any good. If I like it, I, I, I immediately know what to do instinctively. Mm. I don't always agree, but that's you know that's the thing about collaboration. But you know. I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm sick of sitting in this fucking room on my own, really. Yeah. 
<laughs> that, that, that actually be probably the anthem of the country at the moment. <laughs> yeah. I'm sick of sitting in this fucking room on my own. Yeah. <laughs> There's a song for you. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if there's going to be lots of COVID songs, lots of lockdown songs like Get Me Out. I'm sick of fucking sitting in this fucking room. W- weirdly, there's hardly any. I mean, people have been very productive, but people. I think people are so sick of thinking about it in the words. They're not putting yeah. hardly anybody's put it into a song, have they? It's not much. It's so mundane. It's so mundane. There's hardly anything you can write. It's not real kind of pain, is it? It's just boring. Bo- I mean, it's boring, very hard. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. very hard to write songs about boredom and make them interesting. Well, interestingly, that's kind of was your starting point in a sense because you came out of the last period where the word boredom was uh, <laughs> was like a key word. Yeah. You know, 75, 76. You talk about that a lot about, you know, the initial glam rock period, how amazing that was, you know. And then there was that. And I, I remember this as well. I'm slightly younger than you, but I do remember late 74, 75. It just suddenly, suddenly got really boring, didn't it? It did get really, bo- it did get really boring. And it was sort of, a bit like um, people started making your heroes like Bowie and Roxy started making albums that weren't quite so good. It's like I didn't really like Siren and I didn't like pinups. No, I didn't like it, but there's just nothing to it, is it? I mean, it's just it's nothing you can get into pinups, is it? It's just a bunch of cover versions. Um, and it was just a fallow period, wasn't it? So it just and they started not looking quite as good. And I mean, it's not, that's also something to do with you growing up. Mm. You weren't we, we, really, yeah. you weren't, you weren't completely enamoured by everything they did. Yeah, so you, and then, you, you actually, sort of, and then, the, then the sort of year after that, you know, you get that horrible feeling. I remember getting this horrible feeling. It's like I was in bed one night thinking, oh, nothing's happening, and why don't people do this, and why don't people do that, and I wish somebody would do that, and you suddenly think, oh, fuck, it's up to me. I've got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> would you have preferred to actually be a fan? You know, if they just kept making the great records and you could just just bought them and listen to them? Uh, no, no, I wouldn't. That, wouldn't, that wouldn't have been enough. Yeah, so you would, by hook or crook, you would have ended up uh, being yeah. a creative person, yeah, because you want to do it. You, that's why, because you like like this stuff so much. You go, well, I want to do it. I want to. I want to affect people's lives. I want to affect my own life mainly, but you also want to <laughs> yeah. affect other people's lives and you know make them. I don't. I don't think I wanted to make anybody happy exactly, but um, I did want that feeling of like kind of. Uh, you know, seeing Roxy or Bowie or Sparks and walking in the school the next morning after Top of Pops and everyone's talking about it. And I, I wanted us to be that. And I, I, mm. apparently we did it. Yeah, I mean, we people did. Told, yeah. People told me that, you know, well, we went went into school the next day and we talked about you and said you were shit. And all these other people said you were brilliant. And um, it's really weird when you sort of achieve the things you wanted to do. Mm can't get your head around it because you, you never think you never think you'll achieve anything and then when you do it you think oh I don't know quite know I don't know how to react to this was it a bit well, like maybe, oh is that maybe, it? Yeah. <laughs> is that all there is yeah yeah <laughs> you get in the magic kingdom and it isn't really that magic <laughs> it's magic in different ways you you never lose that I mean, as a fan and as a kid, I mean, you, you're young and everything's exciting. It's never that exciting again. Mm. Even when you're doing it yourself, it's exciting in different ways, but it's never it's never actually that magic anymore. Mm. Yeah, That's I, guess... I, always missed, I always missed, you know, those days and trying to recreate them, if not for myself, for other people. And do you think you're still doing that now? You're still trying to recreate that, that oh, all yeah. enveloping buzz of being... 14, 15 in the early days, 72, 73. That, yeah, I'm, you know, st- I'm, still, I'm still stuck in 1972. <laughs> <laughs> and was it, when did you get your first guitar? Was it was it in that period or was it after that? No, it was in that period. Mm. It was, um, as most people's guitars were, it was just rubbish. And, and it's just, 
I didn't realise that it was, you know, you had to, it would hurt your hands, otherwise I probably never, would never have done it. Um, but you just, you just persevere on your own. I mean, now there are YouTube videos, you, t- t- you know, you can watch other people worked it out for you. But I didn't know anybody then, and I had to work everything out for myself. But now that, you can go, yeah. how do you play Moon Age Daydream? Oh, somebody, but some bloke will tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so then, yeah. So, so then, were you playing playing along with the records? Is that yeah. how you did it? Like the time honoured yeah. old school way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and which record? All... Which records would you play along to? Um, bizarrely, there was one record that I learned all of, and I didn't even like it. Which was which was an album called Rock and Rolling Stones. And I never liked the rock. I never liked the Rolling Stones. But it, and they were just them doing um, Chuck Berry cover versions. I, I didn't know there were cover versions. And it's, it's like with Sean Arnott. I didn't know they were a covers band. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes and then you go go back and be discovering, go, oh, this Sean Arnott did this. This is a Sean Arnott song. Only they did it 10 years before. Um, <laughs> so is it quite naive, quite a na- lot of naivety? Then there was no information, yeah. was there? It's hard to know no, anything, no, wasn't it? No, you yeah. couldn't. You couldn't hear a song and then put the title in and find out who's who, who did it. Mm. You just had this title, and ho- and, ho- and then I would go on, uh, go down to like the rock, the rock on rock on record shop and just go through records, go through the singles, hoping I saw this title. Mm. Most usually, I didn't. It's, it's but funny because we. When you grow up outside London, you always think everybody in London's got it all worked out and understands everything. But it's just the same naivety, isn't it? <laughs> we had slightly more. We had slightly more access to things. Um, but no, it's, it's, st- it's still people like you know groping around in the dark. Particularly then, it was people groping around in the dark. That's why things came out all wrong. That's mm. why you know punk is actually all wrong. But that's yeah, the good thing about it. Which is cool. great, yeah. Yeah, the people in our fans, they, they never sounded like the way they really wanted to sound like. Mm. Just this yeah. other thing came out. <laughs> <laughs> so what inspired you to get guitar? Would it, would it be Mick Ronson or, yeah. or would it be Bowie himself? Or was he actually specifically Mick Ronson? Well, it was It was Mick Ronson. Well, was that? It, it was trying, you, you wanted to do that. First of all, you wanted to learn it so you could play it for yourself. And then... Then he wanted to take it on because I was, I've never been very good at I've never worked out. I've never been one of these people who sat in their bedrooms working out every single note. I just sort of had roughly it. And then when you get electric guitar, then you can start because I, I could, I just started with all the feedback and everything. I could do all that before I could actually play. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it wasn't really a kind of um, real babe mag- magnet that <laughs> making loads of scoring <laughs> sounds. But that's that's where I started, so I could do I could do all that first. So that that came natural for, for me, not having to act, no discipline. Mm. So, so then I but then I had to sat down and sit down and really learn. But with also with glam, the style thing was really important as well. So yeah. why why are you kind of fumbling your way towards the guitar chords? You're fumbling your way towards the look, aren't you? Yeah, you're fumbling fumbling your way your way to looking like. Not that I could ever look like any of them, but you know, you, 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 you yeah, you, you were constantly thinking that's how I, co- I came across the sex shop because I just wanted some brothel creepers because I thought they were the shoes to have. You know, it was that that will be the day type period. And, and I was just obsessed with, I was obsessed with the, the look of rock and roll. You know, I loved Teddy Boys and all that. I didn't actually like rock and roll, which was, didn't like the music. I just wanted to look like that. Mm. So, you know, found the sex shop and started this mishmash of, of styles. I didn't really right. want to, I didn't want to be a teddy boy or even look exactly like I said. I just wanted, wanted elements. Yeah, that was that interesting sort of detachment at the time, wasn't it? Because there was that thing with the rock and roll revival, but it yeah. wasn't about the rock and roll, was it? Roxy Music had it. They had a sort of 70s, 50s look, didn't they? Even Bowie, to a sense. I yeah. mean, he, looked like a, he looked like an outer space teddy boy, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> and even yeah. when Malcolm and Vivian were doing Let It Rock, it wasn't really for the teddy boys, even though they went there 
yeah. there was something else going on, wasn't there? Like, there was, was something else going on. Just just the fact of where it was and the clientele. I mean, the, I think where it was, I think I think they put it there deliberately. Well, not they put it there. They it's the only premises they could get, but. The fact that it was there in the King's Road doing something completely, I mean, totally 100% different from everybody else. It's sort of, that's what made it really, really exciting. The fact that it was different from everybody else. Yeah, because you had to walk along the whole street from the tube station to get there. So it's kind of, yeah. it's, you're on a mission. And yeah. when you walk back, you look completely different from what all the other shops are looking like. I guess they were the tail end of the 60s and this was a shop doing 50s but kind of future 50s in a way yeah yeah it was it was it was a different thing i mean i i don't remember the 50s i was born in 1959 so i wouldn't remember people walking around looking like that so it's all seemed really new and exciting like winkle pickers were like really really new and the fact that they were also old at the same time and you're kind of like challenging the way time works, I suppose. And it's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So in a way was it before we did the interview, we talked about, you know, um, the future and the sixties promised the future, which never seemed to quite turn up. And this is part yeah. of this as well. There's kind of a, you know, going down the King, the King's roads, going to the shop, buying this kind of retro future kind of look at, and rocks music and Bowie. Yeah. The kind of pro they are promising a future. There's something futuristic about them. And was that something that sort of, um, established those ideas of future in you? Or was this something that's already there from the 60s? Because I think the moon landing happened and afterwards you're just waiting for the next thing and never turned up, so it was glam no. rock. <laughs> no, uh, no, it wasn't that. It, no, it wasn't. It still be from the 60s. Like, I didn't... I was, I was born in 59, so I was 10 by 1970. So I didn't really, like... I didn't really take much in from from the sixties. I didn't really like it, you know. I wasn't I wasn't a Beatles fan. I didn't follow music at all. And it wasn't it wasn't until the early seventies. It just sort of you know suddenly I, I was of that age, and it was like a, a, it's a coincidence. I was of I was the right age for the right time, mm. and that's always been a sort of coincidence, really. Um, I know there's other people, I mean, obviously people younger than me will go, oh, it's amazing, first time I saw the Jam Balls, first time I saw the Smiths, or first time I saw the Beastie Boys, or whatever the fuck it is. But, um, and it's like, it is like you, you never forget your first time, do you? Mm -hmm. so I, feel I've, I feel I've, I have forgotten losing my virginity, but I haven't forgotten seeing, <laughs> seeing Virginia playing on top of the box. <laughs> Was that your moment? Was that the defining moment that changed everything put everything to the yeah that's, that, that was that was that was one of them and obviously you know the traditional star man that everybody talks about now which mm. at the time nobody talked about i didn't know anybody else liked it no none, none of my friends said wow did you see bowie no no <laughs> yes but it has become iconic years later on it and yeah. also what's what always amuses me, it wasn't actually the first time it was on the TV. It was on, no. it was on lift off the week before, which everyone, nobody ever mentions. No, that, never seen. <laughs> <laughs> so that what was, so was your So weird that no one has ever seen lift off. They can't even, right? They can't even do that hundred club thing about, yeah, I saw lift off. I've never even met anybody who pretended to see lift off. <laughs> I remember it. <laughs> Did you see it? Yeah, but yeah, it was, it was kind of a, it was kind of a, one of those kind of Wednesday afternoon type shows, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. But, yeah. but, like, but like Mark was in '77, you know, one of those kind of coming out from school kind of programmers, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, I well I didn't know it was going to be on, but I'd never heard of him, so I wouldn't have watched it. So, so, so I missed was, it like everybody else. So what was so, it about Virginia playing? Was it the way the group know. sat, looked, and sounded, and the attitude, and the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know why you like things, but I mean, it, it's like suddenly, this is like nothing else. And it, and it had, I mean, I love the fact that it, it was, it had like synths in it, but and, but synths that have, had never been used like that before or even since. And I love the way they looked. They mostly all had short hair and um, just... When that was just sort of defining moment. You think, well, I, I want to do this. Mm. This is what I want to do. 
But again, they didn't really kind of affect everybody. It wasn't like the Sex Pistols. Suddenly everybody went out and got like greasy black hairdos and and streaks in their hair or, or, or cat's eye glasses. I mean, it didn't really, it wasn't like that. But, you know, that, it, it's like once seen, you can't unsee it. So it's like you can't go back to... I mean, I was de desperately trying to... I didn't... I wanted to be a musician, but it wasn't anything I wanted to play. And I wasn't good enough to write my own stuff. And I certainly couldn't formulate my own stuff because because you need... You know, you know, you need input from the world, don't you? Mm. I mean, no one comes up with it. No matter how much they may claim they do, they, they just can't sit in isolation in their room in lockdown and come up, come up with a totally original thing. No, they, they nicked it from somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that, that was what was clever about those people at Roxy Music, wasn't it? I mean, it was, there, were, there were influences, there were nicks, but they were just reconstituting it in a way that yeah. was so 72, 73, weren't they? Yeah, is that postmodernism then? Mm. Oh, is that what it is? That's the thing that's what it is. Everything's been done, but cut up and put back in a different shape. But put back in a different shape, but in such a way that people who listen to it know what it is you're referencing. Mm. That's why, like, like Blade, Blade, Blade Runner and Adam and the Ants, because everyone always to say, like, I used to do interviews and, and they say, yeah, you're, you're very postmodern. So I don't know what that means. You know, but it's always those interviews that you have to do. It's like you're, you're, you're post-punk and you're post-modern and you're this and you're that. And you go, I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> yeah. I guess Maybe it's just it's just posh terms for things that you do anyway. I guess. I mean, yeah, you know what it means because you're doing it without having to think about it. Yeah, but you didn't know you were doing it. Yeah. But you, but it appeals to you in a way that somebody else could call that, but you wouldn't call it that, would you? So, when you see oh, rock music in '72, it's it's definitely there's definitely an artful side to you that's probably not um, manifested before, and suddenly it's going, "Wow, this is it! This is what yeah. works." Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I was 13, so I wouldn't have had been exposed to much, you know, art theory really. Mm -hmm. So. And um, I remember read, I've read that book, Remake, Remodel, by Michael Bracewell, which is, is a hard read, actually. It's a bit like a textbook. Have you ever read it? Yeah, yeah. I know, I know him as well. So, he's, yeah, he's clever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a bit too clever for me. A bit, a bit too clever for his own good, I think. Um, but it's a great book. And I just love where how, you know, he's, he's got all the influences. Now, the influences are not... Um, they're the mostly subconscious. You just sort of become this person. You don't know why you become this person. You don't know what has made you into this person. You just you just go towards the things that um, you gravitate towards the things that you like. There's no other reason for it. I mean, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be doing it if you didn't like it. It didn't excite you. So so you you're quite young, very young then. So it's yeah. going to see them play is is. That'd be difficult then, wouldn't it? So you're kind of in this world, but you're not really in this world. And imagine at school, by then you're in, you're in North London, I think, aren't you? So you'd be, yeah. would you be, would you prefer to be the only person who got into it with that much depth? Yes, I was. I mean, a lot of people liked them, and I remember there's some bloke in my class who was mad about T Rex and was just obsessed with T Rex, and I liked T Rex. I had all their records and everything, but I wasn't obsessed with them. No, there were no other kind of really big Rock Seal Bowie fans. I mean, they liked the odd single, but as far as sort of like thinking, this is this is now the way I'm going to live my life. Although there's, there's no template. They didn't actually give you a template for living your life. They just, you just thought, oh, I just want to be like that. But I don't know what that is. <laughs> Which is so the when, best way to do it, really. So, so were you seeking that at all, or, was, yeah. or you not? Know, so, when you went walked into the uh, sex shop, was that when you sort of discovered the this kind of subterranean world? Yeah. Or, or was it? Or was the places before that which had been no. near Missy's? So that was. No, no. That was it. That was it. I didn't. I, I didn't know that subterranean's world existed or what they were or. It was a complete eye opener. I don't know if anything else like that had ever existed. It's, I'm sure that other people experienced different things with different things, you know, before that, but that was my epiphany. 
Mm. And what was he because like? I don't, doing? I, don't know, I don't know if people were doing that kind of like just anti, anti the world thing. Mm. I don't know if anyone had ever done that before. So, so just by just by going in there to get a pair of shoes within five minutes, it was it was a full on sensory experience. It was there was like an attitude, a vibe. Um, yeah, the whole thing, and you connected with it straight away. Yeah, yeah. I did, I did, and you, you do come out a different person. You do come out a different person. You think, well, tomorrow I'm going to start, you know, I'm going to start something. Well, you know, the flares have got to go, obviously, and um, got to cut my hair, got to dye it, you know. <laughs> what Was it intimidating, like a lot of people say, when you went in there? Um... I was a bit intimidated. I, I did hover around across the road, but not for long, because I thought, I've come all this bloody way. I'm, I'm just going to go in. I can't go home again. <laughs> and I won't, I won't get my creepers. I have to go back on the track. And then it's like, what was the point of running away? It's only a shop. Yeah. I, don't know what, I don't know what people would think that people would do to them in the shop, like creep <laughs> on them and beat them up. I don't know. I guess you get humiliated in front of Yeah, you get humiliated. Yeah. These people are really, really cool, and you're not. And um, it, it is that that kind of that thing about. I used to have the same thing about the shop assistants in Bieber. You know, I probably don't know, but they, they had all these makeup kiosks, and there were all these girls working in this this on these makeup kiosks, and they all had like veils and black lipstick and. And black and, and black nails, and I was, I was just so like, oh god, oh my god, oh they're so sophisticated. Those <laughs> seventeen-year-old shop assistants, you know, yeah, yeah. who just went back on the tree, back to cat, but you know, or, or, or somewhere, they, they, were, they were no different from me. I mean, what's, I mean, I mean obviously, obviously, Bieber's a challenge, isn't it, for a, a young teenager to go in? But but sex was different, wasn't it? In what ways would it feel different than Bieber in that kind of attitude in that? Um, the atmosphere of it. Well, Bieber's was, was huge for a start. I mean, the big Bieber. I didn't go to the other big because it was it was a girl's shop. So no point. Mm. There's nothing in, in it I wanted. Um, it, it was huge. It was like a department. It's like walking into a department store. But the idea was that it was a department store, and so you're not intimidated. No one's going to look at you in a department store. But in that shop, you know, there's one entrance, and it's like, and you just walk in, and the people sitting around. There's obviously just everyone looks at you. <laughs> Yeah. And you don't know what to do, you know. It's like, oh, I better look at this, these trousers or something, you know. And you, you must have been the youngest person in there virtually, because what were you then, I 13, 14? Yeah, yeah. I, I always, I always think of you being the youngest person of that little period, you know, on that little scene. Yeah, yeah. I mean, being 13 and they were all for 18, 19, well, that's, that's a huge gap mm. at that time. Um, yeah, I think I was the youngest person. I don't know why I was the youngest person. I'm, I'm sure that maybe there were other people, but I'd, I'd never met them. I've never heard it? about them. Of course, the intimidation was a key part of it, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. the idea, you know, and, and the piss taking, because that's what yeah. actually made punk, wasn't it? It, it, it? it kept refining itself. It was never, there's no such thing as that will do, was there? It, no. had, it had, to, had to be for a reason and it had, be, had to be for the best possible reason, didn't it? And yeah. did you feel that? Feel, I mean, obviously, I think you probably had a bit of that actually when you went in there, being a Roxy fan. Yeah. But did you did you feel that that was like amped up quite a lot by when you went in there that first day? Yeah, yeah. It, because it's it's now real. It's now it, it's now physically real. You are physically past part of it. You are physically talking to people and buying physical clothes and putting them on. You're not sitting at home, just mm. watching it all on 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 top of the box. So who was in there that day? I think it was was it Vivian? I think just, it was just Vivian. It was yeah, just Vivian. Which was which was um, I mean that was an experience just meeting Vivian. I mean, she was perfectly nice and, and normal. She didn't look normal. She had just you know all the white hair and she had these purple lines drawn on her face and she had black leather pegs on and winkle pickers. It was a strange thing for a woman to wear at the time. Mm. Well, she was perfectly nice. She was perfectly and sold them like creepers. And said goodbye, mm. and that was it. So you went back the next day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wanted to go back the next day, but it was a storm. Uh, 
<laughs> no, I went back on Saturday. Mm. I think this was, would have been Thursday or something, and then I went back on Saturday. I didn't buy anything, I didn't have any money, but I just thought I'd have another look. Just so I was home. very intimidated, and also like Vivian came up to me, and, and I just said, have you got any car? I had, I, you know, I, I, fortunately, I didn't have to, the embarrassment of having to say, oh, I'm just looking. I said, I actually want a specific thing. Yeah, so when you yeah, what weren't the things I would ever have imagined that you know those those white pointed ones. Mm. So so when you went so when you went back, you were just hang around the shop looking at the stock, just holding it yeah. because they're like yeah. works of art, aren't they? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Doing like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, and, and then you and you then, start going going back more and more and getting to know the people there, I guess, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I, 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 um, yeah, I, be, I just became like, because I'm going every couple of days. I don't know if other people do that. I think I suspect they did. So I just used to bunk off school and go there because it was just a better place to be. Mm. What, what people did you get to know there quite well? well Jordan and Michael. Period. Jordan, yeah. Michael, uh, Vivian, Malcolm. I mean, Val Malcolm was always a laugh because he would always sort of tell you these. He always had these anecdotes, which were completely untrue. <laughs> <laughs> so honing down his craft. Yeah, from the beginning. Down his craft, a complete liar, a complete fraud. But in a way, that's perfect because the, the pop that you like doesn't really deal in truth, does it? It deals in. In artifice, it, it, doesn't it? And it, it's... it deals in artifice and it deals in, um, you know, sort of strange. I mean, Roxy, I always thought Roxy, they, they sort of provide a, the strange nostalgia for things that have never actually existed. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It's, no, I wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't into Leonard Cohen. I didn't want to hear his truths. Hmm. So it's, it's in a way, it was an escape or just creating yeah, a different yeah, yeah, world. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it, was, it was totally escapism, yeah. So, but it was I mean, about something. Did you feel that being in this... I mean, initially, the wonderment of the stuff in the shop, the atmosphere of it, is, and the characters are in that are, are really fascinating. Yeah. But do you, do you feel like there's an end point to this, that you would work in the shop or maybe well, maybe you'd fire you in an artful way or maybe eventually... Someone asked you to bring your guitar down to the shop. I mean, that's not really in the picture there at all, is it? I didn't think. I didn't think there was. They had any, any interest in music. I didn't think that. I didn't think there were any other musicians going in there, like mm. me. Um, I didn't think this would lead to you know a whole new rock band. And I was very surprised when I heard that Malcolm's. Oh, where's Malcolm? Oh, he's in New York with the New York Dolls. That, I mean, that's the most obvious thing in the world now, but then it didn't seem to make any sense. So I was just thinking, yeah, but they've got long hair. <laughs> They're a band. I, mm. I remember you, t you telling me once that when you were walking back down Denmark Street and you saw uh, Vivian walk along the street yeah, and some te te teas and coffees, and you're thinking, what are you doing here? And she said, I'm, I'm start working with a band. <laughs> yeah, I start, I mean, because the, the, two, the two scenes didn't ever meet. You know, there was that Kings Road scene, there was, you know, the Kings Road fashion scene, and then there was kind of, you know, Denmark Street, kind of stuck in the seventh, stuck in the late 60s um, music scene. And there was no, and you never saw anybody down there looking st stylish. And you, you, you see Vivian coming towards you, wearing that, you know, the, the black lyrics fur coat, holding these coffees, wearing those pink boots with the straps around them. And thinking, well, don't, don't worry. Hello, what are you doing here? She said, oh, I'm just working with Malcolm's band over there, you know, at the QT rooms, as they then were. And um, I didn't really have, I was too shy to say, what band? What sort of, what, doing what? You know, <laughs> can I come have a look? And I just said, oh, great, you know, see you later, bye. And that was it. She didn't say anything, yeah. didn't volunteer any information. And I never asked. I, I mean, I wanted to ask everything. What band? You know, what, who is in it? What's it like? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you try and imagine what the band would be like? I mean, um, did you uh, imagine it be extension of the shop? Would they all have those pink boots on? Is that yeah. how you imagine in your head? I don't know what, what I imagined in my head. I think man, maybe I'd just sort of uber glam, almost sort of Zeke Zeke Sputnik type of thing. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. I thought maybe that's what it was. I mean, I had lots of, you know, I was sort of buzzing from this idea, like, I've got to see this band, got to find out more, you know. Mm. And uh, then the sort of bit kind of, as going into ship, started hearing about this band, and then this sort of handouts would start appearing. And it's like the first thing I saw was just the, the press release, which they just put on chairs. And I thought, well, can I take this? She said, yeah, you can have it. And it's just... Cool, it's the first free thing I've ever had in this shop. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, you, you know, it's like, it was, I can't remember what it said, but it said, you know, the Sex Pistols, we hate everything. And I thought, fuck, you know, that's brilliant. Yeah. I but I think I'd seen some other handouts in the shop that Malcolm brought out from, back from New York, and it was one for television. And it had, to, it listed their songs, like Venus to Milo. Mm. That's a brilliant name for a, for, a, for a song, and the fact that they put their songs on that, you know, our hit, our songs include Venus to Milo and whatever else, little Johnny Jewel or whatever it, whatever mm, it was. Jimmy Jewel, yeah. So, so there was a sense that was there was a soundtrack coming to this hang around in the shop. There was a sense there's another world starting to formulate, but nobody yeah. knows what nobody knows what, what this is. thing is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no one knows what it is or how it fits in or how because no one had done it before. Um, it seemed very, I mean, rock and music, music and the shops still seem completely separate. Even though they had the great jukebox. Was a jukebox yeah. in there at that point? Yeah. yeah. But but in a way, that was more like a prop with great records on. Would it feel yeah. like that? Yeah, there was nothing new on it, which is one of the mm. reasons I really liked it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in the shop at that point, the other people hanging out there, would Sid be in there and Glenn Matlock? Because Glenn worked in there, didn't he? Yeah. On the Saturdays. Would those people be around that much or would you be going in on different days? No, I met I met Glenn. He was in, always in on Saturdays. Sid wasn't in there very much. Didn't work there then. Mm. Um, but I did see him walking down the King's Road with John. I didn't know who they were. I just, you know, Sid had a pink satin suit on. John had, I don't know what, I, I think he had that pink blazer on. So I was just... Wow, I've mm. never seen anybody like this. They don't look like the other people that you've never seen anybody like. Didn't know, I didn't no idea who they were. And I'm just going down to the shop, and I'd never seen. It was just it, they were taking elements of the shop that I didn't take. You know, all mm. the sort of rubber stuff. You know, I hadn't, I didn't get the rubber stuff. Obviously, not being a rubber fetishist, and I thought, well, I don't. What are you supposed to wear this? You know, this doesn't go with anything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what what stuff did you like in the shop? Then were you more into the shirts they were making? Yeah, the shirt, the, the uh, shirts and the suits and the sort of you know, and the jackets and stuff like that. I like the kind of like fifties, that whole fifties tailoring vibe. You know, I've, I've oh. got a couple of sort of big gangster suits from there and big big forties suits. I like all that. Like zoot suits and yeah. yeah. So what? Why didn't you go across the road to Don Let's Place? He was dealing that stuff as well, wasn't he? I did. Oh, did you? But <laughs> did but, but, yeah. but did you did you have to sneak over there when Vivian wasn't watching yeah. because? <laughs> yeah, you did. You didn't couldn't because well, Acme was up the road. There's no way they could see you coming out. It was quite a far way up, but it was in the back of some great gear market, the great gear market, or one of those markets. And I just found this stall. It was a stall, first of all, with Don working in it. And I think I, I bought um, like a, this white jacket, white fifties jacket with all kind of black, black lyrics thread all over it. Um, that's the thing. First thing I bought from Acme, which I loved. I didn't have a lot of stuff. They had like you know the scooter and loads of shirts, but it it, it was I liked it. It was nice, but it was much more traditional because it was just. It was it was just old clothes. They hadn't done anything to them. They hadn't created anything with them. They haven't gone postmodern with them. No, they hadn't <laughs> gone postmodern with them. They, they were just um, they were just a bunch of old fifty stuff that they got, which was yes. great, but not quite. No, it didn't didn't have that that edge. Yeah, the, and and the challenging atmosphere of sex wasn't there either, was it? I mean, no. the, I mean, Don and Jeanette were much more friendly. I, I imagine. Yeah. Well, Jeanette was. <laughs> <laughs> but but you kind of embraced the challenging atmosphere of sex because he was testing you. And what did you 
did you want to be tested in in your art and your music and your style? You know, no, was... I didn't want. No, I did not want to be tested. No, no, to no, see. not to be humiliated, but to be, to be pushed. You feel feel like you're getting pushed towards something. Why are you going to go anyway? But you just need an extra push. I thought this this was going, this is going to be difficult to get my to to get myself into here, and they're not going to accept me as I am. And in fact, I don't accept me as I am. And so you'd have to become something else, which I was fine fine with because it, at that age you don't know who you are. Mm. So what did so you I find when when you, when you when when you actually found yourself in the shop? I don't know. I, um, someone who is a sort of a bit more, um, a bit more out there, out there than I thought. Although I think mm. I, I think I suspected, you know, I, that I was an oddball, but and, I, and that didn't worry me at all because it's like you know I didn't gravitate to what was going on. Mm. I didn't. I mean, I had friends at school, but I, I wasn't. I wasn't like them, you know. I wasn't. Um, I wasn't studying for anything. I was it's, it's the worst student in the school, probably. <laughs> and uh, wasn't interested in football. Wasn't interested in like kind of shit fucking disc, school discos. I wasn't interested in their music. Um, so it wasn't. It wasn't easy. It wasn't hard to abandon that because there was nothing there for me. There was just nothing mm. there for. So when you find something else, you think, well, I want this. This is brilliant. That's gone now. I mean, what, what was interesting about that and that scene and the people in it, it's kind of rock and roll, but they're not really rock and roll people. Even Sid Vicious no. wasn't, wasn't really a rock and roll type person. No. He's 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 a, he's a Roxy Music clothes horse, like like you, yeah. Ernest says. Yeah. I, um, and I, and I, don't, I never thought of you being, I mean, obviously there's rock and roll artifice to what you do, yeah. but also... You, you're probably. I've always thought you kind of like a, kind of kind of a nerdy kind of person, who discovered this kind of fascination with rock and roll, and then you get John Lydon, whose persona now is so far away from what he actually really is like, because he's he's a bit, he's far more intelligent than he lets on, yeah. and far, and far more uh, gentle in, in a way, and more feminine. Yeah. Like, like he yeah. does like to play play the Arsenal hooligan thing, but that's not really him, is it? And. This is what always fascinates me about that group of people. It's it's rock and roll, but not rock and roll at the same time. Yeah, no, it was it was it wasn't rock and roll at all. We never talked about music. We never went in and said, "Oh, I've got the new Doctor Feelgood album or, or anything." There was never any talk about contemporary music. Mm. There was some talk about the Stooges, some talk about the Velvet Underground, but that's that's really even Roxy and Bowie. They were like kind of not phrases. I mean, because. Malcolm and Vivian, true to form, hated Roxy and Bowie. <laughs> so you think, well, I'll, I'll keep that quiet then. And it's... Um... <laughs> but, but Roxy and Bowie... Was, it, was, it, was Roxy the gig you would see a lot of these people at more than Bowie? Or yeah. Which, you know, yeah. Yeah, much, the, more, much more Roxy. The, the, was it the Empire Pool gig where everybody turned up? You know, where, where, I don't know if you wouldn't even know those people there, but didn't Susie turn up in a... Mm dressed as a giant as in a, a dress that looked like a fish or a, mer, a mermaid or something and I, I can't remember i didn't see it i, I, I saw vivian there mm. i saw vivian that you, you know you remember paul you sort of said sit downstairs i was sitting downstairs and she was sitting over there. i think she was with chrissy hind and she kept she kept she kept standing up and going you're disgusting you're disgusting <laughs> <laughs> and i thought oh god is that woman from the shop and it's like you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and what Sid was there in his gold lame jacket as well, wasn't he? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yes, that's that famous picture. I saw, I saw it in my girlfriend's Honey magazine. I thought, oh, I know that bloke. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I've seen that little picture. It's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. So, so in reality, a lot of these people, people just like like were dressing up. Like, really, wasn't it? Yeah, and the yeah, and the, the personas that came afterwards were very one dimensional, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, someone said to me, it's like, yeah, did you think you were stars? So of course we thought we were stars. What do you think of doing dressing up like that, you know? <laughs> but it's only afterwards you had to work at it by actually being in the band. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, then after that, that wasn't enough. You had to go on and, and actually do something. It wasn't just good. It wasn't enough to just walk about. But... Um, I mean, what, what, what were you dressing like at that point in time? You know, um, was it your 50s look? You know, the jacket you got from... 
uh, boy, you know, um, uh, for, for, you know, from Donald's yeah, it, place. It, it yeah. Big, big, Ray, big Ray-Ban sunglasses that weren't real Ray-Bans. Yeah, all wraparound shades like the Beaver Underground and 50s jackets and leather trousers or, you know, and brothel, brothel creepers with everything and sex T-shirts mm. and mohairs. You know, it was, it, I suppose, it, to me, it was a rock and roll look, but it wasn't, it was very loosely based. Was it was there a sense, because when you're young, it always feels like things will last forever. This is it. This is going to be, all I have to do is just walk up the King's Road, dress like this, and this, this summer's going to end, never going to end. <laughs> no, I didn't think that. I didn't think that, because they, they would change, because the other thing is they would change the shop all the time. And one week you'd go in and go, have you got those boots with the things? It says, no, we stopped doing them. We sold too many. And it's, <laughs> man, we just get bored with doing things. It's like, and if you did, unless you had to buy things immediately, otherwise they'd be gone the next week. And they wouldn't get any more because mm, they were too brilliant. popular. So, so when when the Pistols played the gig the first time you went to see the Pistols, yeah. was it uh, was it an affirmation? Not again, of course, not the music, but of of all these little strands coming together, like yeah. the Roxy gig, but but in a smaller place without the other people. It was just and, the people from the shop and a few others. Yeah, because I wasn't involved with Roxy Music. I didn't know them. There's no way, mm. you know, they were just sort of gods to me. And you, you just bought a ticket and went and sat in the audience and see everybody else. But this was something that you're actually, you actually were involved in. You actually saw people that you knew that were involved, that you actually knew the band. Well, I, I knew one of them, you know. It's so so that, that was just, you know, knowing someone in a band was just... In a, in a real band, a proper band that were pro- playing down London, was mm. sort of, um, and it was something that you were, you were, you were one of them. You were was one it, of this it, crowd. Was this the Madame Jojo's gig? What was the first one? No, it was. Uh, I, I saw them the El Paradiso. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's and that's that's really early on in about a third gig or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So 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 when you after after that. I mean, when you're watching the band, it's more like they look good more than they sound. The sound isn't important at all at this point, is it? Um, I could hear, you know, that it was, you know, I mean, I liked what I heard. Mm. What I heard, I couldn't really decipher, but it sounded, you know, I could hear guitar riffs that I really liked. John's vocals, and John, and John was just amazing. It was just like, you know, a singer who sang with his hands in his pockets. <laughs> And wasn't that it wasn't going love me, love me, please love me. Mm. You would, I mean, it's the attitude that got you. Yeah, like, like people don't stand that now, do they? It's just because it was it was before that there was nothing at all like that, was it? There were a no, whole new no. thing. Whereas now it's been copied relentlessly, hasn't it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah and, 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 and I was just I just went away, just wow, that was incredible. And I tell people at school, like. I oh, saw so the sex people, they were great. So what they like, oh, they're just brilliant. And they're wearing this, and John did that. And it's like, what well, their song's like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. It didn't, it didn't matter. There was, there was just a cacophony of sounds which sounded right. Yeah, and that's the other interesting thing about them, isn't it? Because again, it's it's a rock and roll band that's not really rock and roll. They're writing really no. weird songs that don't follow conventional structures. It's not they're not really twelve bars. It's this is no, not twelve bars at all. It's something, it's something quite new going on here, isn't there? And it's uh, quite artful yeah, as I, well. I mean, the, what was what illustrates that maybe to people who weren't there was um, Julian Temple's Doctor Feelgood film, and I, I liked Doctor Phil. Thought they were good. But they sort of he sort of he made them look a, a lot better than they actually were. And then there was sort of like and then like and then there was a bit where and then punk happened. And then there was he juxtaposed the feel goods on stage and the pistols on stage. The feel goods on stage and the pistols on stage. Do you think the feel goods it was it was just old. Mm. It was just old and not very in, it, they were good at it, but it wasn't as exciting as this other thing. Yeah, the pistols took it to another space. Well, yeah. also because there's so much more going on in that pot. It's not just a band, is it? I mean, it's a style. Yeah. There's an attitude. There's an there's aesthetic. An there's, yeah, and, it, 
and it's coming from the shop also. Uh, like John Lyon is bringing a lot of stuff in there as well, isn't he? Because he's a complete one-off. It's, it's, yeah, it's, and, 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 and the, the, the fans, you know, the fans of which I am one, you know, brought a lot to it. They were bringing their own things to it. You know, when you went, went to see Dr. Phil, you know, there's, there's no, you're not affecting anything. You're just a bloke in the crowd, you know. Mm. But that really kind of, and it grew and it grew, you know, and affected people. And then more, there's more and more people. And there's more and more people who've cut their hair, who've recently cut their hair. You can always tell, can't you? They've never, <laughs> never quite lays right. And um, <laughs> yeah, it was very, a very different thing from just going to see a band. So, did you want to be part of this? Did this make you go home and get the guitar from out under the bed? And Yeah. Well, I'd never put the guitar on in the bed, so it's like, mm. you know. But, you know, seeing Steve, I suddenly, because I was confused, do I want to play my, my Mick Ronson? Do I want to play, like, do I want to do, like, do, like, the Stooges? Do I want to do, play that ostrich guitar at the Velvet Underground? Like, I liked it all, but I hadn't crystallised it into one thing. But seeing Steve, and, you know, Steve's thing is always like, well, don't fuck about. And it's like, um, you thought, well... That's it. And I, I, mean, I didn't, I can copy Steve, but I can't be Steve. Um, so I thought it, it was just the directness of it. And it's like, it, it swept away all the sort of confusions in my mind about what sort of music do I want to make? You know, it's just like, well, I, I can't do lots of music. I can't play like that, but I can play like this. I can do this. And through 76, I guess everybody, well, nearly everybody on that scene is thinking about being in a band or doing getting on a stage, just doing something. Yeah. But 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 not. To, but you, oddly, you you don't seem to join all those permutations. I mean, there's lots of permutations of people playing each other's bands and going to being bigger bands. Yeah. But you're not really doing. You're not there, are you? So what, what's you? You're still more interested in being in the shop and walking down the road and playing guitar at home. Are you just waiting till you're ready? Or I'm waiting. I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for till something comes along that I'm interested in that, that I can. I mean, we did. I was I was in the sort of first lineup of Chelsea with Billy playing guitar, and then June October. Then they chucked me out, actually, which was actually a really good thing that they did because mm -hmm. they were just playing these sixties songs. They were playing like you know, it's all or nothing or Sha La 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 Lee, and I thought, I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a good band of him, but I don't want to play this. And then they, and then John Crean phoned me up and said, "Well, you're out." I was sort of like, obviously, I was sort of like upset, but also relieved. I was like, oh, good, thank God. I didn't really want to play this. <laughs> I didn't, didn't know. I tell him I don't want to be in your band. It's just, I can't play something else. You know, I'd only been in it two weeks. It's like, it wasn't my, it wasn't my, my place to say, I don't like what we're playing. Can we play something? Yeah. You know? Was that so, a two guitar? A two guitar? Line yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Billy was playing guitar. Mm. I was playing guitar. Oh, so that's why Billy asked you to do the the famous uh, Banshees gig because he was initially yeah. doing it. He was initially met, doing it. You met but him at Queen. He, was it a Queen gig where you met him or something? In a, yeah. yeah. Um, I, was he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember Queen. Queen played. You can date it. I don't know when Queen. Queen did a a free gig in Hyde Park, and uh, supported by Kiki D, who had done just done. Um, I've don't, got don't break music. in my heart. Oh no! Yeah, no, it was I've got the music in me, which I quite. Oh liked. yeah, yeah. She was supporting. I didn't really like Queen. I used to like a couple of their albums, but you know, then, then they went all kind of like semi prog rock, didn't they? Mm. Um, mm. Also, I had no hope of ever playing it because I didn't understand what the fuck was going on. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a big thing. We just don't understand what you, you're listening to this music and you listen to this guitar playing, and it's just alien. You, you, you think, I, don't, I wouldn't even know. How do you do that then? Now I know. Yeah. It's taken me 40 years. But I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. then I didn't have a clue. So when you can, it's, it's like, that's one of the reasons I got into Link Ray. I mean, I only bought it because I thought he looked good in the cover. And you put it on, you think, hang on a minute, I know what this is. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's about four really effective notes. <laughs> yeah, it's four effective chords. You, you, yeah, I didn't even have, have to play notes. You think, I know it's just really strange. I know what this is. I can play it, <laughs> and that's really yeah. exciting. And you can suddenly totally understand music. I mean, I totally understand Nick Ray. There's nothing to it. 
That's why that's why I understood it. Mm. I could suddenly play. I couldn't. I couldn't play anything by anybody hardly. You know, I could just play bits and pieces of you know, John and many dancing things. Um, well, I, so I think you, you're being a bit modest there because when you listen to the band you eventually put together, Models Guitar yeah. Planes, fantastic on that. It's what you're ahead of everyone else. Yeah, I was actually ahead of everyone else. I, I, I don't like to admit it. I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I would. I, I mean, yeah, I was. <laughs> and, well, it, uh, but, it's, it's um, not. It's, it's not all bar chords thrashing away. It's it's nuanced, great rhythm guitar playing. It's got a Johnny Thunder's vibe to it, but it's actually in time, which is <laughs> which. No, I, I, mean, Johnny... I, I, I could play in time. I could play in tune, which is a, a massive boom. Mm. And and that's playing, being able to play, being able to tune up was was a huge advantage that I had over every, just about every other guitarist. Well, because there's no tuning machines, so it's, it was, <laughs> no tuning it was, machine. Uh, it was so difficult tuning up, and every gig would have a ten-minute gap where people tried to tune up, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, 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 no. You could always hear on those sort of Roxy tapes. You can always see, like you know, it's, it's always sort of like the sound of the crowd, and then some bloke going ding, ding, ding. ding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the singer going, no, "Fuck off, no, you fuck off, yeah, cut." You know, it's all that, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> Tuning the guitar to the bass—that was the one that took the longest. Yeah. <laughs> So 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 Billy's at the Queen gig. Comes up to you, says, "Look, I've got, I've got this gig coming up. I, I really don't." No, he didn't, that. didn't say it. Then he, we we had to go back to his house in Bromley. He had a big house in Bromley. Oh, is that in his um, uh, his van? Because he's the only person on a van, money. So no, we went on the train. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, well, I met Philip. I mean, Philip Salmon was the first kind of person who came up to me, like he dressed like a, you know, the green sari and green hair, and I thought, oh, you know. Mm. This looks like a sort of person I want to know. And then he said, Oh, you know, meet my friends. And they were sort of standoffish, but they're all right. You know, I met Susie and Steve, who were always, always were standoffish. And, um, but I think, you know, looking back at it now, it's just all shyness on our parts. It was just teenage insecurity, wasn't it? Mm, yeah, because people forget how, how young everybody was, you know. 16, 17. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, if you watch things like um, the, the Ziggy Stardust Hammersmith Odeon film, I mean, I, was, I watched it and I, when I was there, and it was um, this, the, this, the age of the crowd is unbelievable. They're 13, 12, mm. you know, 14. Yeah, like I'm really not... young. They're really, really, really young. There's, there's, there's not even any teenagers. Yeah, gig audiences are older now, aren't they? It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's inevitable. It's been around longer, but then yeah. it's still a new form, wasn't it? Yeah, it's still a new form. It was still a new form. It was. It's only been there for, going for 10 years, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, so, so there's more space to operate. There's more ways to mess about with it because it's not formulated, is it? So. No. no, there are only three types. There's only three types of music. There's rock, reggae and funk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And none of them really crossed over to each other. Yeah, because it's hard enough playing one, let alone learning another. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. So, so you went back to Billy's house and he just talked about, he talked about this thing he had coming up, he didn't really want to do it, or how did it all, no, how did it all pan out that? He, I was just sitting in his room and he, he said, he was sort of playing me kind of, he started playing me like what would go on to be Generation X songs, like Ready, Steady, Go, and like I'm in love with Kathy McGowan and all that. And um, it seemed to be very organised, far more organised than anybody else. He really had a sort of an idea of having a career. Mm. I didn't even know what that meant. It's just yeah. like, <laughs> he'd actually sat down and written, this, uh, written songs that his band could play. Yeah. And that actually thought about them, which was just, it was just like, I thought, wow, oh, never thought of doing this. But then he said, look, you know, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I want to be. I want to be really serious about this, and I, I don't want to be on stage with Sid because he's a nutter. And I, you know, if I want to go on stage with these people, who just can't play. And I thought, well, he said, "Do you want to do it?" And I said, "Yeah, I'll do it." <laughs> with no idea what I've just agreed to. So what? What made you decide that? Was it uh, when the total, obviously... total, total um, knee jerk reaction by just saying yes. Was it was it because you're also interested in working these kind of interesting looking people as well? Would that yeah. be part of it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and also also the 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 you can be on stage 
you can elevate yourself to a more tr- a more hip position. I thought. <laughs> You're not, not the little kid that comes to the shop anymore, but the uh... no, no, I'm actually in a band now. I'm important now. <laughs> and of course, you know that, that, that was part of it. You know, sort of, I think I always had my eye on some prize, but whatever. Mm. Didn't know what the prize was. So you have, you have a look at that point. It was that that point. It was just like, right, I'll make myself more fashionable, I, I, and <laughs> I won't be as naff or, or insecure anymore. <laughs> Which is what everybody's actually thinking, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it is what everyone's thinking, isn't it? I mean, just that's what they're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a, you have a twenty minute rehearsal right before the Clash's place in Camden. Don't no, you? it was longer than a twenty minute rehearsal because there was a lot of sitting about going. The idea was to play songs you didn't like. Right, so we had a list of songs of which I, I mean, I think like Sugar Sugar. I was thinking, well, I really like Sugar Sugar, but never mind, okay, well, we'll do it, we'll do it really badly. Because <laughs> that was a big thing. It's like, you know, it's like, I think at the time it's like the worse it was, the better it was. And it was just mm. like, well, we, we can do that bit. We can be really bad. Yeah, like it's, well, it's taking We Hate Everything to its logical conclusion, isn't it? Yeah, then, <laughs> then, we, then. Then I think I think we we even kind of like went past that point of being really bad into just not being anything at all, and it was just like I, I'm always proud of it was like you know my first gig was with a band who had no songs, no rehearsals, and didn't care. I think I think Susie and Steve they may I I think maybe they'll admit it now, but I think they were really really nervous. Mm-hmm. I wasn't. Me and Sid weren't really really nervous even though we had no idea what we were just about to do. <laughs> but also, we were all into Velvet Underground. So I thought, I thought, I thought you know, this. I think maybe it was me who so said, oh, this is sort of like Sister Ray. And as soon as, as, soon as I said that, you know, everybody else went, oh, okay, Sister Ray, it's okay what we're doing. We're doing Sister Ray. Yeah, there's a framework. Yeah, there's yeah. a framework, or, or it's based on something. It's not just completely, <laughs> <laughs> completely <laughs> nebulous kind of like, for idiots making a noise. But Sid's actually not, he actually can get a beat on the drums, can't he? He's not, he's not yeah. completely, no. he's actually far better than people make out, wasn't he? Yeah, he was really good. Mm. He couldn't play particularly well, but he did it for a long time, which was like a, a big plus. He was really good. Mm. Steve, Steve can play anything. I mean, he just never, never picked up a bass. But, and so credit to her. I mean, she, she had to stand in the middle and, you know, playing with these people she didn't know, playing what she, we didn't, she didn't know what she was doing, but we did it anyway. I mean, I remember sort of looking out the crowd and you could just, all I could see were these sort of green Riddler question marks that were sort of like, what the fuck is this? What the fuck are they doing? And it was, um, because we didn't stop. (laughs) We didn't didn't stop after three minutes. Just playing to empty the room, but the room didn't actually empty. No, it didn't empty. <laughs> it got it got fuller and fuller, in fact. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just what it's just one of the classic so, defining yeah. punk gigs because it just, it defines that spirit of just oh, do it. Yeah, it really was just do it. Well, what? Or well, it doesn't matter. Just do anything. <laughs> <laughs> just do but, anything. Anything will do. You know. But for you, it's you always. Know, it was always going to be a one-off, wasn't it? That you had no intention of. Once you came off that stage, that was it with that project. Yeah. Well, I don't think I don't think Susan Stevens. I mean, they they had very serious ideas, but I didn't know what they were at the time. But I, I didn't ask. They didn't ask us to continue, me and Steve. I mean, see. <laughs> but you didn't want to anyway. I, I, I thought you were just you were looking for something different. Any? I didn't know. I didn't understand what they're talking about. To be honest, um, you know. And the band, you know, talking about what the Banshees later became, which was a bit, a bit up its own ass. It wasn't much fun, really. It wasn't much humour to it. And because um, I think they were trying to be, I think they were trying to be clever. You know, it's like as, as you're doing that in, in those days, you walk around with books you've never read and no intention of buying a, a reading well, in, in so your pocket. Just make, yeah, yeah. The, Ste- yeah. Steppen, Steppenwolf. You know, like I thought that was well, a great title. Let's uh, <laughs> I'll carry that around. You know, can't be asked to read it. Well, despite um, that, did, did you have the bug to do something then? So that's when you put um, beastly cards yeah. together. Yeah, 
because they were just the only guys I knew, really. Yeah, they're from um, your end of from your end of town, from school. Yeah, I mean they were just all Roxy mad and Bowie mad as well. So I don't know, but none of it sort of. I don't know. I just I think we became a formula. We didn't quite. We weren't quite formulate formulate it. Ick. Um, but then you know Bill Grundy happened, and then it went all over ground, and then it was sort of just not as interesting anymore. And it wasn't because you know oh the Pistols have got really big, they're not your band anyway. It wasn't that. It it was because the the, the it was just becoming really stupid. Mm. Yeah, the original the original idea, punk or whatever it was called, that you're attracted yeah. to, isn't the version that goes post Grundy, is it? No, because the version that goes post Grundy is, is easy to do or easier to do, because you can then you, you can then label yourself, and it's easier, isn't it? Mm. So we never labelled ourselves. We didn't know what to label ourselves as, and we wouldn't want to anyway. But now you know you can say, well, I'm just like this because I'm a punk, and also. I have said it to people. I said, "Look, you look. You think you're a punk and all that, but you and you're going on about the tabloids. But you got it all from the tabloids. It's, you know, punks wear this and punks wear that, and you just copied it all." Mm. Yeah. Whereas, whereas you were kind of feeling your way instinctively yeah. through it. Yeah. But I don't think actually looking at now, I think well, there's nothing wrong with that. For like if you're 16 and wanting something to do you just you just do as you're told by the papers but I, if i um i just just like to say it to annoy people because so, they thought <laughs> being very afraid yeah so, <clears throat> well, well it's, it's not really right or wrong it's just not your thing anymore is it? it's no, not the reason not, it was, it's not right or wrong it's not right or wrong it led to something else and then but it would have um because i think you know, the people I knew were trying to... I mean, with the Banshees, it wasn't an attempt to do something else. It wasn't just the Ramones. Mm. As much as I love the Ramones, they're the Ramones. And um, try to do something else. And, you know, by the time 77 came along, different influences were, you know, were, were creeping in. You know, the Idiot and Low and Craftwork and all that stuff was, like, creeping in. Um, how it would have... And, and it, it, Punk just seemed like, Nothing. It just it just there wasn't anything in it anymore. It was which fun is, and it was easy. Which is but interesting because because the mod, in a way the models are very quintessential seventy seven punk band. Very well played, very yeah. well constructed songs, yeah. but music musically not that challenging. Or no. so it's, it's it's was it just almost like a like a night school to just learn how to be in a band. Yeah. <laughs> It was. It was exactly that because because you wouldn't have got a chance. Because the thing about um, punk is that what it what it the main thing it did is like it opened the door, didn't it? It opened the door so you get your foot in. Because there were no doors open. Mm-hmm. It was impossible before. But it actually opened the doors. And you can you know you can go on the road. You can do gigs. You can actually rehearse and do all the things that you know um, real bands do except you're not really a real band. But it doesn't matter because <laughs> you're something else. Well, you even you even had a, a hit, a half a hit record. We did have half a hit record. Yeah, which is, which is kind of odd because it's because it's a lot. Of, it's sort of overlooked, isn't it, in the period? And it's actually one of the bigger hits because not all the punk bands had hits, only only a few. Yeah. And you got, and it's, it's it's I actually think the band is really good from you know the stuff you can hear sounds great, but it's 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 sort of like a sort of sort of semi forgotten about isn't it it's odd I've, I may, maybe because the name of the band I think you should have stuck with Beastly Cads I think that would have and been so do I but I didn't <laughs> like it I thought, it was a, I thought Beastly Cads was a brilliant name it's great yeah. it's really funny it's it's just like the Pistols it's like one of those names that's got about six different meanings it's quite sarcastic yeah. whereas the models it's quite it's quite a mundane name for the band it's, isn't it's it bollock, it's, bollock, it's a bollock name and um, I, mean, I, I, I also I also wanted to call it Call ourselves. I wanted us to call ourselves the, the Mitford Sisters, but no one got that. But <laughs> luckily, we didn't call ourselves the Mitford Sisters. So also, I think that would be a really well, good name. I guess it depends which sister you're taking is the uh, the ideology. Uh, all of them. <laughs> yeah, no, all of, all of them. yeah, but yeah, because in punk you can you can hold contradictory ideas. So you don't have to explain yeah. any of it. Yeah, no, like you know, New Order and um, 
What were they called before New Order? Uh, Joy Division. Joy Division. I mean, Joy Division. How the fuck did they get away with that? Well, you wouldn't now, would you? But no, then you I don't. I don't. I don't think most people knew what it meant, so they got. That's how they kind of got away with it because you couldn't Google it then. Oh, that's right. <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't find out. I mean, they might as well have called themselves the Final Solution. Well, there's a, there's a band when I grew up in Blackpool called the Final Solution. And no, no one batted an eyelid. But of course, that doesn't mean you're for it. It could just be a comment on it. It's so just it's, it. Yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, it's yeah. like the swastika armband. Of course, you know, if you wear a swastika armband, the initial, obviously, the obvious conclusion that other people come to is like, because you're a Nazi. I didn't know what a Nazi was. I mean, apart yeah. from, we didn't know what Nazis were because all, all we knew is like, they're playing in the playground and one side is British and the other side are Germans. But we didn't know what Nazis were. Yeah, yeah, it's much more naive then, wasn't it? Yeah, much more naive when we were children. And you, it was always that thing, I think everyone's gone, gone through it, you grew up at school in the 60s, it was like drawing swastikas on your planes. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. But, but, but that's the other thing, the, the symbol is far less offensive than the ideology, but people get more offended by the symbol. Well, Which because, is quite, yeah, but, uh, quite telling as well. Because it, it 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 stands for the ideology. But but if you were actually into the ideology, people probably wouldn't mind that. But they, but, the, but if you wore the armbands, that was much yeah. more offensive. If you, actually, I think if you re, you were really into the ideology, you wouldn't go around the swastika armband, would you? <laughs> no, you you just end up getting it into power in the country. Yeah, yeah, you'd keep it quiet, wouldn't you? So, so what post models? I mean, I guess that fell apart just because there's only there's only so far you can go in that year with that sound, and then it just the permutations run out. Yeah. So, and is, is that kind of how that just kind of yeah, yeah just got it, to? It's, it's a cul de sac. Yeah, it's a cul de sac, and you hit a brick wall, don't you? Because it's like unless you're very very imaginative and kind of kind of can take it further, and we weren't very very imaginative. Mm. So, like um, like 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 Buzzcocks could because they they could play. They could do like fuzzy, fuzzy guitar, distorted guitar songs, but every single one sounded completely different because yeah. there's something because, well, because they were they're slightly older, I guess, and they were they were quite clever at what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. Well, we weren't as good as the bus dogs, so mm. we didn't do that. So well, then, uh, and also a general disillusion with like, and I stopped going to the gigs because it was just a fight every gig, and no one else I knew went to gigs, so I didn't see anybody. So it was one of the, I don't, what year was that then? What You can tell me what year it was, because it was... Well, we're really, probably getting to 70, 78 now, the hangover. Yeah, 78, 78, <laughs> 78 was a fucking rubbish year. The end of the, end of the 70s was just rubbish. It really got, it, it, I mean, to me, it, it went from Technicolor black to sort of grimy black and white videotape. Mm. It was, it just wasn't, um, it just wasn't exciting at all. It was a lot, a lot of Dr. Martins. Mm. Speaking of which, you did yeah. Rima Rima. Was that like an attempt uh, to to get away from that straight jacket yeah. punk to to make yeah. an art rock? Which I know you I know you can't stand Rima <laughs> Rima, but feedback song is still one of my favourite tunes. I think it's a fantastic piece of music. But what, was that an attempt to you know to do something the opposite of what punk had been sort of compressed into? Well, we thought it was a mixture of the Velvet Underground and The Idiot and Low and all that, you know, what we were listening to at the time. But that's what we thought it was. Plus, you know, it was, again, Sister Ray plus The Idiot. Mm. It wasn't, it didn't really turn out like that. But, you know, that was, that was, that was the sort of the idea of it. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, The Idiot was such a key record, wasn't it? Because yeah, it was such yeah. a, the soundscape of that record was like nothing else, was it? it yeah, was, yeah. And its influence was pretty big on on the sort of post punk scene, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know much about the recording of the year, but they they did it in down. I didn't have any money, did they? They did it in downtime, and they used a drum machine on 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 fun. I mean, because Bowie hated drum machines, and he wouldn't. But in the end, he, he sort of gave in, and let Iggy use that old drum machine, and that was a sort of, you know. And then people started using drum machines and. But there, there weren't any, there was no Lindrum or like that. You, could, you had to get, we had a, like a Korg Mini Pops, which is a, a very sought after drum machine now, but 
Well, I yeah, love the sound. I think the old drum machines sound better, don't they? Because they don't sound yeah. like drums at all, do they? No. They just sound <laughs> they just sound really odd, but they make great rhythms, don't they? Yeah, yeah. But you couldn't program them. But even if you could, we couldn't program them. So um yeah, and that's what sort of the idea behind Rima Rima was that it that that got caught up in this sort of awful ghetto the you know, Rough Trade, Acklam Hall, Notting Hill, it all became uh, Prague Vec and um, uh, what they called Cabaret Voltaire and all be- I think I thought I just thought it was just all up its own arse, really. Mm. Yeah, because you used to have a pop vision from when you were younger, innit? You, yeah. You, you, I mean, you're, you, really, your idea is that Rock's music, yeah, they could do the art school stuff, but they were doing it on top of the pops. They weren't doing it in Acklam Hall, were they? No. No, they weren't doing it in Acklam Hall looking at, the, looking at their feet. And, and <laughs> <clears throat> and releasing things on 4AD. Because um, before, I mean, it's just, I mean, I, I, remember, I know we put that single out on 4AD, well, they put it out on 4AD, 4AD and I, I just didn't, I thought I thought that was actually worse. That was worse than the whole kind of like disintegration of punk. I prefer the disintegration of punk. At least it was bloody noisy. <laughs> this was all kind of... But it was all like bedwetters, wasn't it? I and mean, it was all like <laughs> kind of not wanting, well, oh, let's not put, let's not cause a stir, let's not annoy anybody, let's not be, all, and for God's sake, let's not be successful. Yeah, yeah. And which, which was the dream of the of, uh, pop for so many years was to take the esoteric ideas and put them into the mainstream. Yeah. Not, 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 not just to the uh, the the learned few who understand. <laughs> yeah, no, so it wasn't, you know. Let's have some esoterical ideas and keep them esoteric. Mm. And they weren't esoteric. They were just done by kids reading books that had pretend, you know, been pretending to read books. But the, tr- the, tr- the trick was, like Bowie and Roxy were doing in the 70s, though, was to make them in- into songs that were in the top 10. So, yeah. I mean, when you were growing up, and you probably that as well, but uh, a Bowie or a Roxy interview was, was an unpacking of these ideas. They were talking about weird shit that you go and check out and listen to yeah. but they yeah. still have a, they still make it into a three minute classic pop yeah. song <laughs> yeah yeah that, that, I mean I did I mean it took me a long time to realize but that is in fact what I wanted to do I don't I didn't want to and I didn't want to play the fucking all, and I didn't want to have anything to do with 4AD it was just bedwetters it was just like kind of like like the kids you pushed around at school <laughs> <laughs> So, the so, kids so, hated. so after that period, I guess you were quite disillusioned and you just went back to your flat and or did, were you still going to the, into, into sex at that point or were you so disillusioned uh, you dropped out of everything? Yeah, I dropped out of everything, not not through any sort of um, depression or anything like that. It just, there just wasn't anything happening. There just wasn't anything happening. And it, that was the, the time I had the horrible, terrible realization that I've got to do it myself you know it's now come you know I'm of that age and it's of that period and I'm now one of those people who has to push things forward so oh god no please not me so 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 you were kind of were you actually on that road were you actually going to do that you have to put your own band together find somebody and you were thinking about all that yeah and and then, then one one day you came home and there's a letter shoved through the letterbox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's and saved I, I, you all the effort. <laughs> yeah, saved you all the effort. It was really good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> which, which, of course, for the viewer that is uh, who's watching this interview, that was Adam had come around. I think it was Jordan, actually, because she knew where you lived, so they came around yeah. together. You weren't in pre-internet days. What can you do? Yeah. You have to write write a letter and put yeah. it through the letterbox. Yeah. Because uh, I'd been out all night at some party, some Steve Strange party actually. Because Steve was just starting to do nightclubs. The Blitz, yeah, you do. You yeah, you hang yeah. in the you hang out in the Blitz as well, weren't you? Yeah, um, he hadn't actually started the Blitz yet. Pre pre Blitz was it? Yeah, yeah pre Blitz. Um, but I was hanging out at you know hip night spots with Steve. Um, yeah, and then I just it just at this letter, I thought Adam. Well, I mean, no one, Adam. I mean, just I demand, well, what's he want? You know, call me soon. You know, there was no, nothing about about anything. So I called him at somebody else's house. And in true pre-internet days, he wasn't there. I left my number, he called me back. 
Um, it's that thing, it's like, you know, that's really hard to describe to people. You had to find them on one line. And if they were out, they were out, you know. Yeah, yeah. And no one had an art machine. Um, then he just said, what are you doing? And I said, well, nothing. Because I'd, I'd, I'd almost rejoined the Banshees for that yeah, tour. Yeah. That Johnny yeah. Kennedy didn't do. Yeah, they, they had the they had the auditions with lots of different people, didn't they, in London? Yeah, yeah. And they, then they used Robert, which they should have done from the from the start. But anyway, mm. um, yeah. So I didn't do that. So I, I thought, what am I going to do? What am I going to? And, and suddenly, the you know, like pondering all these the, the, these ideas, form your old band, form your own band, and as, as you said, it was, that was just a pain in the ass. But that was the in those days there were that was the only thing you could do. You couldn't become a producer or make records on your own unless you're working with, ele with, with electronic music, which wasn't going to. I mean, at that point, it was just really small. It was all like Robert Rensel and Thomas Lear and you know the bloke from you know TV. I did loved all those records, but I was guitarist, so mm. couldn't do that. And um, yeah, so I got this thing from Adam and went and met up with him. And you know what Adam's like, he just fucking talks, doesn't he? And uh, <laughs> he just said he's been thrown out of the ants. And I was like, well, ha hang on, hang on, just explain <laughs> that. <laughs> How can you be thrown out of the ants? He said, well, you know, explain the story. And he said, I want to do something else. And I said, well, that's lucky, I want to do something else too. And he said, my favourite band of rocks and music. And I said, that's funny, so is mine. So... I mean, the, we, we weren't thinking of the Roxy's covers band or anything like that, but um, it showed that we were kind of on the same page. It's just very helpful with someone you're working with. So, uh, yeah, we just did it. And, it's, and he, he told me all about these ideas from Mount and the Burundi thing. And um, I think he sort of said, well, I don't know about that Malcolm's ideas and I don't know if we should use them really. I said, well, yeah, but you paid for them. <laughs> <laughs> and he went, oh yeah. I said, you paid for them, they're your ideas. They're not his, you bought them off him. So I sort of persuaded him, you know, we should use the sort of, I thought, because I thought the Burundi, because it all comes from Burundi Black, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And I love Burundi Black, but I'd forgotten it. I'd never occurred to me to use, to use those drums. But I thought, because I'm not a drummer, never knew what drums were supposed to do. You know, I always wanted some sort of, couldn't the drums do more? Couldn't they be more? You know, because you didn't have Keith Moon. You know, there was only one of him. And that seemed to be the most exciting rock drumming. But everybody else was, wasn't doing that, wasn't doing anything like Keith Moon. They couldn't do it. And so I thought, well, if we start with this sort of strange drum idea, I didn't know if it would work. I didn't know if you could play to it. And, um, and just take it from there. And it works. I don't know why, but it it, it did. And it was, was just a quick, it, it, it was sort of pure postmodernism, I suppose. We just stuck everything in there. Like was that from that, that yeah, from, from the first writing session. I mean, what, we, what, were you working on those ideas? You know, what, yeah. I mean, what would, you, what would you actually even use for the drums? Would you be just playing? We, didn't have any. we just had to imagine them. Yeah, so it's just you playing guitar, Adam singing and fun, yeah, yeah. feeling your way towards it. Yeah. Yeah. We had, we had like one of those cassette players, you know, those sort of long Phillips cassette players. Mm. That was all we had. I mean, that that was that was you know our our recording facility, mm. which is which yeah. traditional is what basically what anyone all that anyone ever had. There were no, you know, there was those four track reels to reels, but no one had them. Mm. I mean, there are there are there are some demos of that very early. Period, but I don't know if they're real or not. I can't tell. They sound good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like a lot of the kind, that kind of drumming, the guitars on there, and you can hear sort of getting towards songs. I mean, are they actually real demos? You know, know, when you actually know. when you get the band, when you get the band, you know, when, when you bring in Terry Lee because you you play with him in models, didn't you? Yeah. So when you bring when you bring him in, is that when you you actually have a drummer who's sort of approximating those beats so you could play the ideas yeah, along I mean, with? They might have, they might have been just rehearsal tapes. Well, yeah, I think they are rehearsal cool. tapes, yeah. Yeah, no, they probably are then. If they sound like us, it probably is us. Mm. We never yeah, recorded anything at that time. 
it does sound like you, yeah. And it's you could you could you could sort of hear hints of future songs in the big sort of like five six minute jams and things. Right. I'll forward them yeah. to you. So you can you can say if they're real or not. <laughs> but but yeah, then adding adding into the swirl of ideas, you make these into yeah. songs, which which is yeah. the interesting part, isn't it? Because it could have gone like Rima Rima. It could have been like a great um, off the wall like John Peel thing, feedback, Burundi drumming, uh, tribal chants, which would be amazing to listen to. But 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 at some point you I imagine was it you or you and Adam go. Both, we, we both did. Yeah, we've got to make these into three-minute songs. Yeah, yeah. No, we did. That was a definite um, because all we liked were three-minute songs. And I know we'd gone off on some sort of strange tangent, but we both went off on some strange tangents with with Rima Rima and Dirt Wears White Socks. I'm not quite sure what we thought we were doing. Well, I suppose we thought we we're being clever. <laughs> In fact, we weren't being clever; we were being stupid. But I mean, I think I think we would. I think those things were like attempts to say, "Look, look how clever we are! Look at this clever thing we've just done." Overthinking no, it, it. Yeah, of no interest to other than ten people. But it's mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when you you, you sort of like we, we abandoned all that. Look at us; we're really clever. Um, uh, so you just abandon all that and you just go, well, let's just get on top of the pops. Because you've you, you sort of gone through every permutation every, of everything and you, you land back from where you started, I want to be on top of the pops. Which is what you should have done to begin with. But what really fascinates me about this whole Adam, Adam the Ants thing is you make an album that's actually kind of almost weird <laughs> and took away my <laughs> socks and Rima Rima. I mean, if you're going to write... A conventional three-minute pop song for that year. It's not going to be "Dog Eat Dog" or "Kings of the Wild Frontier." I mean, no. amazing, amazing pieces of music that they are, but they're not conventional pop songs by any no. measure, are they? No, that's because we didn't know how to write conventional pop songs, and that was <laughs> the best we could do to get. That's as, as conventional as we could get them. Mm. But it's, but then um, you, it's kind of reinvents the fabric. They become conventional pop songs because the record's such a massive seller. Yeah, they they, be, they become a template for how far you can stretch pop. And that's kind of the beauty of great pop music, isn't it? Probably just the yeah. same as Roxy music. Yeah. 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 Um, and we, I mean, before we put it out, there was a lot of resistance from the record company because they didn't really understand what we were doing. Well, we didn't really understand what we were doing. And, you know, trying to explain that, you know, we were, well, we were told we were a post-punk band, you know, a cult band, um, had this sort of like heavy pulp punk following, um, but well, that wasn't my band. I wasn't. I wasn't involved in that. So it, it's. I just thought, well, I don't, don't want, that's nowhere. That's, we don't want all that. We're going to get jets and all that, which is mad, absolutely mm-hmm. mad to alienate your own audience. But um, and we said we just want to get on top of the pops, you know, and have hit singles and stuff. I said, I, I, I was thinking, I, I thought you'd want that. <laughs> yeah. I thought you'd want us to do that but they were very worried about credibility and all the rest of it and it's like but what are the papers going to say and I remember having meetings saying you know, sort of junior A and R men going yeah but your credibility is really important I said what your credibility is more important than selling records <laughs> sorry we're in a major record company why are you telling me that <laughs> although to be to be it's fair to way that, round. It's the, I'm to supposed to be I guess to be fair to them, the the band was actually a big court band. I mean, it's it's not a court band that's playing to twenty people everywhere. It's like a court band that could do um, two nights of a thousand people in London, and it. So it's, I guess they're probably thinking if you just go a little bit further, a little bit in steps, but you're basically going, let's just chuck all that away and just go for the big all or nothing big prize. Yeah, Yeah, we're going to chuck all that away now. That that thing that people spend years building up. What we're going to do is not do it. (laughs) <laughs> this is just stupid and it's completely a, idiotic there is a period of time where it's sort of in between isn't it it's, this is not it, it doesn't go within two weeks then you do car trouble and that's that's bridging it and then suddenly bang it's huge it's, 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 this is a period where, it, where you, it's, the gamble is it's quite long isn't it there must be quite a few points you're going mm, maybe this isn't going to work <laughs> no, just, no there was never a point where I thought this wasn't going to work 
because we did that. We did a tour after car trouble. We did. Is it the ants invasion? So I can't even know. Yeah. The front of the tour, what the fuck it was. And it was that transitional period, you know, because like people coming out to see Adam and the ants and expecting, you know, Andy and Dave and Matt doing, you know, Il Duce or something. And it's <laughs> like, and it wasn't that. Mm. And uh, so it was the same sort of, there was some hostility. It was like, you, you, but it was always my fault, obviously, as I grew in the band. <laughs> I didn't fucking ruin the band. It's not my fault. I mean, it's just, you took our band away. It's not your band. It's my band. I'm in it, you know. <laughs> but there, there was all that thing. You know, that was another punk thing, wasn't it? So, like, they're, they're our bands. No, they're mm. not. Why don't, well, Why don't you fuck off and make your own band then? Then it'll be yours. <laughs> but for quite a long period, the, the, quite a lot of the initial fan base stayed with the band, didn't they? It's only, it's only when it hit... The, the, you know, the virtue after you were on top of the pops, and then the audience age went down to about 14. Uh, yeah. And it became a bit difficult to be an ant fan surrounded by 14 yeah. year olds. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, that, that always happens, you know, you do top of the pops. And it was, it's that thing I said with Bowie, you know, it's like the age of his audience was 14. Mm, mm. I don't even know if he'd had fans before that. He probably didn't. He had kind of sort of gay folkies, didn't he? He liked them a lot. But apart from that, but th then he became a proper pop star. And you're supposed to have a 14 year old audience. When you're yeah, I mean, star. but Bowie was the one, one hit wonder. It took him three years to follow it up, didn't he? I don't think he had any fans for about a year or no. two, did he? No, <laughs> no, that's why he had to so that the only the only song he doesn't own, he didn't own the rights to was Space on it, because you had to flog it, because he's got a kid on the way and no money. Mm. So that's the only song, because he was just, Road blah, what am I going to do? So he had to flog his own, the only asset that he had, which was space on the team. Mm. Never bought it back. And he never, he tried to buy it back, but by that time they wanted like 300 million quid for it. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, it's not worth it. <laughs> so, so, so when you did Kings, you were still aware that, you know, it was, yeah, you're trying to make a pop record, but you're aware that it's got to, it's got to be more to it. And it, this is not like, you know, it's not like Duran Duran or, which, you know, fine, you know, it's yeah. polished, new romantic pop yeah. web. This is something quite different, isn't it? It's yeah. got some heavier themes, it's got some heavier sounds. Yeah. And if, even though it is pop, it's quite off-kilter pop, and it's... And you can listen to it, that's why, why you can listen to it decades later, because it's still like lots of layers to it, isn't there? Yeah. Also, because we had no idea what was happening. We didn't really listen to contemporary music, you know, I remember when we were recording it, it's when Ashes to Ashes came out. That's the only thing that we listened to. Mm. It was new. Everything else we, I mean, I didn't want to know really. I didn't really want to know. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like them. I didn't like all those kind of, I don't know, I don't know who it was about at the time, but um, whatever it was, I didn't like it. And I was sort of completely sort of, I, I knew nothing about anything and I just had what was in my head. Mm. Just film soundtracks and glam rock, and then and uh, Adam had these Burundi ideas and the vocal ideas, and just we we put them all together. I was going to say just put them all together, but it's not quite that easy. That's yeah, a lot of work. Uh, you know. I mean, the, the soundtracky thing is key to it, isn't it? Because it does actually sound like a film soundtrack the whole album. It's so Technicolor, yeah. and also uh, that plus TV themes from the sixties yeah. and seventies when they had all, all of them had wonderful. Theme tunes. Yeah. That's that's kind of all the mix and, and the sounds as well from those theme tunes as well. Was yeah. I can hear echoes of that in there. Yeah, and it's all in, it is all in there because mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, TV theme. You know, the, the Persuaders and the Apartment S and all that, and the, and the Prisoner. Mm. I, I wish I could get more, more. I could have got more TV film themes in, but there's only so much room. <laughs> there's enough in there. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and and it was a massive success. I mean, it was a dominating record of that year. Yeah, I mean, did, did you always feel like this is something that could go on for a long time? You you could just you got the form, let's repeat it. Or was it was it like well, that's so massive, we're never going to get any, anything that big. So let's let's just sit back and just do our thing. I don't know. I don't think so. No, because it always had to match up to that, didn't it? Mm. it? Always had to be that big again. And you know, by that time, my ego was very big and I didn't 
you, you get elevated into the most successful pop star that anyone knows. So it's always, you know, you can, and you get into that strange thing where people try to impress you with, with their, what their band's doing. You go, oh, it's nice, isn't it? And it's just... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, like, I, I like that feeling of being successful. Mm. Well, so much famous. I wasn't too bothered about that, but being being successful. Yes, yeah, it's, it's sort of proven that what you do works in a in a way. Yeah, on your on your terms as well. Yeah, well, they were only on our terms because Sony wasn't bloody interested, and they just thought, I don't even know why we got signed. To be honest, and um, they didn't really try and change anything because they didn't couldn't be bothered. Mm. Um, and then once you've had this great success, it, it's like they don't interfere anymore because it, it's like, you know, oh, we're not, you know what you're doing. Well, actually, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> and that's when I Prince Charming... possibly Char know what we're doing. And that's when Prince Charming comes out and was... Yeah. Which, which, you know, at the time, people felt it was, you know, it's... I mean, it's a good, they felt it was a good record, but it's a bit of a, a bit of a come down from yeah, Kings. But yeah, now... I know. But if you listen to it now, I actually think it's an equal record. I think it's a fantastic record. I think it's a really underrated record. I mean, what's, what's I think, your feelings on it? I, I think it's an underrated record. I mean, it, it was that thing about we couldn't... We, we would never match, you know, the sort of impact of uh, Kings of Our Frontier. It's a bit like Nevermind the Bollocks. The reason they've never made another album is that I think Rotten's scared about we'll never do anything better than Nevermind the Bollocks. And, and the more he waits, the more that... That is now true. They will never make an album that's like Never Mind the Bollocks. But had they do, done it a year later, maybe they could have done. They could have matched it anyway. Yeah, but I don't think they were the kind of band that should have had a long term. No, career. they didn't want it. it I'm, I'm sure half the band did, but I think it worked. <laughs> it worked perfectly for what they they did. Whereas you've got the option to make the second album. Yeah. And and it's, it's ended up being an underrated record, but if people actually listen to it properly as a record and not as, um, you know, the, fir the first one's so successful, how can you, well, not, not the first, first one we use, so successful, how it's, you can't follow up that level of success, but actually as, as a record to listen to, it's actually, it's equal. But we had, we had these sort of strange ideas, which is like, what can we do now? And I think we saw sort of at some point, um, okay, our next single, We've had singles with loads of drums on. Our next single was going to have one on, and because <clears throat> that seemed like funny, it seemed <laughs> funny, and it seemed it Wait. seemed irrelevant, ir irreverent, and uh, it seemed like and shocking for people. People go, well, "What's not like your other records?" You know, that's the idea. It's not supposed to be like our other records. Whereas, you know. Particularly now, common sense dictates that all your records, all your singles are supposed to be the same. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a diversity of sounds, but I would say there's more than one song on there that sounds like a hit single. Yeah. Well, Stan was it? Yeah, Stand that was... Like, Stan Liver Stand your, your, was your first number one, wasn't it? Yeah. Stan the Liver was like kind of... Um, No, I was going to say it sort of started with it, it, during the Prince Charming thing, but it didn't. It didn't really. It was just a title. I think we didn't. We didn't sit down and write anything until until after Prince Charming. I'm um, sorry, after Kings. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Stand the was one of those great things that come together in five minutes. The initial thing came together in five minutes. Obviously, it did, then took time to sort of like you know really, really hone it down. But the, the initial thing was. 75 percent of it was there in five minutes. I like I like the themes. To me, the themes are still unpacking uh, the sex shop, aren't they? You know, you know, you just on the pirates is is a um, highwayman, and this this these are all things that are running around in the core of the original punk ideas. Not the punk as what it became. Hmm. This out this these kind of outlaw ideas and and the stylizing of the outlaw. You know, the the sexiness of the outlaw or whatever, which is very Malcolm and Vivian in it, and it's getting. Yeah. And it, it doesn't it doesn't really get played out in the Sex Pistols, but it gets played out in Adam and the Ants, yeah, which, which is really interesting. So in a way, Adam and the Ants were Markham's almost perfect band. <laughs> yeah, but I did never admitted that. I mean, 
I mean, also we added maybe maybe too much, you know, maybe too much like carry on Adam and the Ants sort of because that's what made us up. Because we got into just like making ourselves just laugh all the time. I Maybe mean, I think we went too far with that. It's just like this is we can't just admit, look. This is not a joke. I mean, it, it can be funny, but it's like we should um, rein that in a bit. And I think maybe we should have done, but we didn't. So. Uh, we're having too much fun, really. I think. I mean, the the, the, the greatest things, the the great my, my favourite part about Adam and Ants was just sitting and writing. We used to mm. just go into a studio, and at that time we had some fucking security bloke on the door and all that stuff. And it's like, and we just come up with these mad things and just laugh. And the, the things we thought funniest, the things that stayed. Mm. Mm. That, I mean, yeah, those, I mean those, those are really good periods. I mean, that, that album still has all the themes of the, of the other album, you know, musical themes, it's, it's soundtracky, the TV themes are in there, the spaghetti Western sounds. Yeah. They're, they're just, they're really odd places in pop as well. The diverse places where you're taking ideas from, from Rolf Harris across, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's not just Chuck Berry, this, is it? It's No, no. Although there is some rock and roll in it, but it's, it's deliberately post-modern rock and roll. <laughs> which, is, which one was that? Would that be that Pablo Picasso? Would that be a bit more? Yeah, in the middle of it, it goes into that the riff that we nick off the New York Dolls. You know, meanwhile, oh, back yeah, in the jungle. Yeah. It's a great song, that as well. It's my favourite song on the album. I know it's yeah, an older it's, song, but it's, it's yeah. a great, really great version, really technical. Yeah. I was, it was, it was, I was glad you recorded it properly then instead of recording it two or three years before, you know. Yeah, but it was. I, I loved that song. I loved that song because when Adam played it to me, but he didn't really know what to do with it, and it was mm. a mess. Or the whole structure, it was. It's weird because it got so many bits, and it took. I had to arrange it into flowy bits, you know, flow a bit, of, and you can't take anything out because he'd notice. And um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a much better version than the, yeah, the earlier version. Yeah, 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 it flows flows better. So. Um, so I was going to say, yeah, yeah, no, that's it. I don't, I mean, now to this day, I don't know what the fuck it's about. But I mean, it has a, just a brilliant. It just sounds great. It's just, it's great imagery, isn't it? The greatest titles ever. It's a brilliant title. And it's, it's like a painting, you know, which again is what great pop should be. You should put little pictures in your head, you know, yeah. musically and word wise. Yeah, I always thought, I mean, I always thought our stuff, you know, I think if people think about stuff, but like trying to think about like, you know, pictures of red, they're always in colour. Which mm. is deliberate. Yeah, you know. I think I think Dirk was monochromatic, and I do love Dirk. Yeah. But but yeah. when you come on board, the band goes more day glow and, and color and Technicolor and Technicolor. film soundtrack. Yeah, and I've I've always liked that that switch. Yeah, yeah, that was that was deliberate. That was deliberate. I think it's not, I, I did want people to sort of like shut their eyes and imagine sounds, sound, you know, sort of visuals, you know, filming yeah, that, visuals. Yeah, I always think they like films. I, I think yeah. I, I, one day maybe somebody will make the film for the soundtrack, you know, back to front. <laughs> mm. People have done that, haven't they? They did it with, um, what was that weird song about something jump, somebody jumps off the day, somebody jumps off the Tallahassee Bridge? Oh, I know what you mean, God. It was, yeah. it was a song by Bobby Gentry, and then someone actually made a film telling the story of the song, which the story of the song isn't in the song. It's a surprise that people don't do that more, you know, it's to, to, re to interpret it, you know, uh, a piece of music into to, a film. I would love to see, you know, Picasso visits the Planet of the Apes in a film. That was like, <laughs> right, let's see this then. Well, that's one for Tim Burton. <laughs> yeah. And not only did he do Plan the Apes, but I think he'd actually get the concept and we'll make the film that would actually suit the piece of music. <laughs> yeah. So, so at this point in time, um, the, the band thing, you just there's only so long you could be in a band in your life, isn't there? You know, um, when, when you get well, to no, about 30... Some, some people are in bands for the rest of their lives, aren't they? Sort of. Yeah, but it's, it's not. It's, it's always a bit uncomfortable looking, isn't it? You know, that, um, you know, the last gang in town thing, unless yeah. you reconstitute it into, into a different way. Yeah. So, so, so at this point, um, it becomes Adam and the Ants becomes Adam Ant. Yeah, uh, which is basically a duo, isn't it? It's you and Adam. Yeah, working with the name, isn't yeah. it? I suppose yeah. you could call it Adam and Marco, but no, we weren't going to do that. <laughs> he wasn't. <laughs> he wasn't going to do that, was he? <laughs> well, I suppose in pop terms, 
he, he is i mean he's a great pop star isn't he so it's, yeah yeah that's kind of, that's kind of the asset i suppose um you know the I visual wasn't, asset I, takes. I wasn't hoping to compete with that ever <laughs> yeah. i think it went for a funny period where we thought i was trying to steal the band and i think mm. it accused me of trying to steal the band and do what with the band <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What? I'm sorry, what are you talking about? It's like, I'm going to steal the band and do what? I'm going to yeah. say, fuck off. <laughs> Maybe thought it would be like a, like, on, sort of on top of what we talked about a few days ago, but like a glitter bound situation. <laughs> yeah. You, you go yeah. off and have the biggest hits. <laughs> yeah. No, so, that, so, that, never, that never crossed my mind. Well, you know, it was one of his strange delusions, wasn't it? Yeah. It did well, last long for but it's, it's always like that in bands, in insecurities and yeah, insecure. It's just terrible insecurity. But I, except, I never thought I was going to get the push ever. Mm. Not, I don't think you could have given me the push, really. Um, no, I was pretty insecure. I was pretty secure in my position, which is must be. I was always think that like with boy bands, it must be a terrible situation because they all sing, they all do the same thing. Well, they're all about, they're all looking for a solo career, aren't they? Yeah, they're all looking for a solo career. So it's like, you can't walk into rehearsals and suddenly say, I want to play drums from now on. I mean, it's just not going <laughs> to, it's just not going to do that. It's just not going to happen. So what was it, what was the dynamic like when you work in, you know, it's just the two of you, I mean, obviously there's a band built around that, but it's basically yeah. a duo with a band in it. So does that change the creative dynamic? I mean, you, you actually have more, you have a, you, the next album is actually really successful. It breaks you in America, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you, well, you had total creative thing. I didn't have to keep thinking. So I don't know if Adam ever gave much thought to the band, and it's, uh, but I did because I was sort of in, in this sort of strange in-between. I'm the and in Adam and the Ants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So sort of go-between. I got sick of being a fucking go-between. You know, so I can't be one thing or the other. And it's just, and uh, that's one of the reasons that the band broke up. Because it's like, you're really not going to talk to them. So I've got to talk to them. I'm like, well, what makes you think I want to talk to them? <laughs> so uh, it's, like, um, it's like two and a half camps in the band. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, mine was the half camp. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to keep the two camps together, which is not... Which is not what I wanted to do. But this is not, you know, being a sort of a psychologist or a politician is not what I wanted to do. This is not my my. Mm. That's not my gig, man. Mm. Mm. It became my gig, and it's just it's terribly difficult. So it's easier just to to to, to shrink yeah. it down to the core. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as, what, what's as it? difficult as, as difficult Adam can be to work with, he's not difficult to work with when it's just one on one. Hmm. Mm. Less insecurities, and you know, everybody knows their role, which I think is key in a, in a band or any kind of unit, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think everyone did know their role, but he, he was certain that they didn't know their role. I mean, yeah, but it, it is it is the insecurity and the paranoia. Well, was it was also a sense that you have to change your style a bit? I mean, I know, yeah. I know the album it still does have some of the so called tribal drums, and, and some of the elements are still in there. But, but we put that in deliberately. Deliberately, as, 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 as a sort a of you know, hallmark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, so the records that come after, you know, that period, the sort of more solo period. This it always seems to me is trying to find a style, and it doesn't doesn't seem to find itself on. There's, there's some great tracks in there, but it's it's the uniqueness seems to go. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean, we sort of. We had this sort of idea that it, that it was going to be like the Sun Sessions, but also while realizing it could never be like the Sun Sessions. But you know, it, it would have that idea, that that idea behind it. Um, mm. uh, it's, but I mean, I love making that album. That was like the, the most fun we ever had making that album because there was no one else around. Mm. I mean, Friend of Foe is a great track. You know, it's one, yeah. it is one of the classics. It's it's one kind of sort of over, even though it's a really massive hit. Yeah. Sort of overlooked in a sense, but it was a big, it was a big hit in America as well. Yeah, it was, it was. Yeah, it was a big hit in America. I think we always had this thing about we shouldn't have put that bit in the middle. There was like a bit that sort of goes half time in the middle. It's like that's what that's why it wasn't number one. 
it's because we put that half bit, half time bit in it. And I was like, well, I don't think you can really, you know, sort of <laughs> work it out. <laughs> yeah. Work it out. So it's that part that did it. Yeah. At that, I mean, that point to even to even have a massive hit with such a, a so it is quite a quirky band for a pop band. Yeah. It's still it's still going pretty good if you can still pull that off of that, you know, three, four years down the line. Yeah, but we didn't know we didn't know how to not be quirky. We didn't do it on purpose. Mm. That's just what came out. It's just sort of who we are, quirky people, I suppose. Yeah, well that was that's what made it perfect. The balance between the pop and the quirk is is what makes it an interesting band. But that's not something that we that's not none of that is what we tried for. We weren't trying to make let's be quirky. And let's have seventy five percent quirk for this bit and twenty five percent non. Yeah, it's just what's, it's what sounds good to your own ear, isn't it? Yeah, it's what yeah. sounds good to your own ear. So, 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 tailing out of all that, are you starting to work with other people as well? You know, like, like be more of a gun for hire. Were people sort of coming to you asking for you to do songwriting for them? And... No, it wasn't at the time because I didn't really have time to do it because we were always mm. on the road. With this, you know, the Admant big band with the fucking brass and because we did big American tours of that. That was when we did big American tours, like trying to really, really break it in America. Um which which I found terribly tedious. Yeah, um, you do you're going off touring at this point, aren't you? I'd gone off touring at this point. I'd, I'd gone off touring, I, I, but I always go off touring for, I'd, I'd go off touring for about five years and I didn't do it and I say I'm not I'm never going to do it again. And then sort of some Somebody comes and pers- who won't take no for an answer, which is Sinead and Siobhan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. What? Don't I get it? No, you've got to do it. No, you're doing it. No, I don't really <laughs> need doing it. <laughs> so, so why did Sinead O'Connor come to you then? Was she a fan because, of no. the band or was, it, or was it just somebody put you together? It's going, yeah, that might yeah, be interesting. It, it yeah. Pop- was Faulkner, I met her manager who said, Come and play some guitar on Lion and the Cobra, which I did, and she liked it. Mm. Then we became friends, and then it was like, Oh, you're doing my tour. Hello, you're doing my tour. And it's like, Am I? She said, yeah. And, it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then that was before she had nothing compares, compares to you, and that was got, got really huge. And then I thought, Well, you know, this is now a lot of money. And it's going to be a huge tour, a huge world tour. And I, this is what I've always wanted to do, like big, not club, the opposite of club dates, you know, football stadiums. Mm. So I thought, I'll do it. And it, mm. it, it was a brilliant experience, actually. Was it was it different uh, working in that camp than and the Adam camp? Was it was it less responsibility in a sense? Yeah, yeah there was no responsibility, almost no responsibility apart from getting the bloody guitar parts right. But that is my job. Uh, mm. So uh, I took that responsibility because it is, in fact, my responsibility. Um, yeah, yeah. It didn't. It didn't have all the kind of. Um, well, she had, as you as you well know. I mean, she had her moments and everything like that. But it wasn't really down to me to sort it out. Mm. I would sort it out because I liked her. And I wanted to sort it out, but I didn't. It wasn't my job. When when you wrote songs with her, was it the same as you write them with Adam, or, or did no, you, was it a no, different it was, process? It was, it was a different process. It's the process I don't like when you kind of you do a track and then you send it to someone and they sing over it. Mm. Oh yeah, so you much prefer going, yeah, that sounds good. Just oh, just a little bit like that, a bit yeah. more, a bit higher. Oh, that sounds amazing. You know that yeah, little yeah, mistake, yeah. that mistake you made in the first verse. That's the second verse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't. I didn't know. I, I don't like working like that. I think it's just it's very unsatisfying because mm. mm. you don't really have any input into what they're going to do. And then so, it's always like, well, if I knew you were going to do that, I wouldn't have done that other thing. You know, or so, it would be better. So in the meantime, I can't quite remember what the situation was. But were you still technically playing with Adam? But he was. Mm. You just taking some time out and. <laughs> Yeah, well, he had to take time out because I wasn't there, was I? So yeah, then, yeah. Was that, would that cause any tension, or was he? Did he understand that you know that you have you have to play with other people to to for your art? No, he didn't understand. Um, I, he did. He never said anything. I think he was sort of you know being jealous. I think somewhere saying you know you should be working with me. 
you can't do anything else. And stuff. He didn't say it. Mm. For, one, for one time in his life, he buttoned his lip. And, um, oh, before, but you, you haven't mentioned Viva La Rock. Yeah, we're in, we're in roughly the same period, aren't we? But yeah. <laughs> which is actually a great song. You, when the context talking about it, uh, well, it just as of what it is. Yeah, it was a glam rock and roll album. Mm. So going back to the roots in a way after after. Well, we never of... left our roots. I still haven't. Oh, I, don't I, to ever, I don't intend to ever leave my roots. Actually, now no, it's there too was, late. There was attempts to make more sort of eighties pop in a way, weren't there? You know. Yeah. You know, with 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 almost like a Quincy Jones, you kind of vibe some of the tracks. You know, so was it was this like a taking it back down to 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 actually what you fell in love with when you started with Viva Rock? Viva Rock was a sort of the idea of Viva Rock was that came from Espresso Bongo. I, I know it's nothing like Espresso <laughs> Bongo, but it, it was like a kind of Soho Soho rock and roll. Mark Boland feel, you know, with Tony Visconti producing. We wanted mm. very much an English feel to it. Mm. And was it and for you? Is it good to get back to that sort of yeah atmosphere? Yeah, because it's completely my 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 thing, isn't it? Was it was it frustrating that it was? I mean, it did, it did okay, but it wasn't. No, yeah, it the, wasn't. The huge it, records uh, are gone now, aren't they? Yeah, because. We were, still, we were still working on that. Let's do the opposite of what everybody else is doing, and that was the period where that, that just didn't work anymore. It'd be, it, it was like with the whole dance thing. We got with Stockache and the Water because they they just did. They're brilliant, but they do the same. They, they don't fuck themselves up by going, "Let's do something completely different." Mm. Um, and record companies weren't going to take. They weren't. Gonna, they, they weren't going to take chances. You know, your last your last album has to sound, your your new album has to sound like your last album, and the album like that is going to sound like your last album. I mean, what were you? Do you sell? Were you self managed at this point? Uh, mm, well, Adam's always self managed, isn't he? No, we had we had various managers. We had Miles Copeland at that point. Mm, mm. Yeah, it just it just seemed. I mean, I think the creativity seemed to be there, but the the the, the cards were never put on the table in the right order it just seemed you know like live aid or whatever it just yeah. it, it was it was like we didn't have the chance to make those first impressions anymore mm. it was I, I just I just we just kind of went back I mean maybe we were sort of like what we'd run out of steam you know we went, went back to what we knew and maybe that was a mistake but, you know, with Kings Rock Frontier, you had that chance to make your first impression and you only get one chance. Mm, mm. So um, we'd, run out, we'd run out of first impressions, really. But it was all right. I mean, I liked making it. It was, it was interesting working with Sconti. No, it's a good record. And it wasn't like a downward spiral. It was actually like it sort of lifted everything back up again, didn't it? It just, yeah. it just out of sync. I mean, m- most of those people from that period that we talked about earlier on, Careers were pretty flatlined at that point, weren't they? You know, yeah. Well, they they turned to dance music, mm. or somewhere, so somewhere in between the two. Like well, like Billy Idol actually did a very great job of putting rock and roll and disco, in a sense, together. In 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 a way, he went to America and did what Adam should have done. <laughs> yeah, we should have we should have maybe gone the ZZ Top route. Really, I thought. <laughs> with, 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 with a program backbeat or something. Yeah. I mean, like you talk about Billy Idol before always having a plan. You could sort of yeah. see when he went to America. Whereas, whereas even though I, th- I, th- I think Adam's very instinctive, yeah. I think, and, and you're and you're a great songwriter and that. But I think when you're going against the grain all the time, yeah. it's gonna it's gonna catch you out. Where it's whereas, gonna catch you out, and that's that's why it caught it caught us out. And and you know, Billy's a great. Um, He's not stupid in any way, you know. Mm. If he knows what he's doing, well, you know, he seems like he knows what he's doing. Um, but maybe you're right. Maybe we were just, we, we were completely instinctive or just trying to guess, just trying to, which we'd never done before. We'd never, never tried to guess what would work. We just mm. did what we felt was 
what we liked, and that that co and that would either coincide with the public or not. Mm. But you can't you can't guess what people are going to like. No, no. I can't even. I couldn't even guess what Admiral was going to like. <laughs> yeah. I'd come up with something. I think we was really going to like this, and he'd go, "Well, yeah, not really." And you know, I said, "I thought you'd like it." I said, "Well, no, I don't really." <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so after this, though, you must have actually been okay because you didn't have to tour anymore because the band's not as big. You've done the, you, you flogged your way around America, and yeah. the band's got to a pretty good level in America. But that, now you could just come home and it was just a period where you could actually enjoy the money and just you know play with whoever you felt like and yeah. take it easy after ten years would be pretty intense. Oh, I did, I did really desperately need a rest actually. Mm. You know, but you know what it's like with rests; they go on too long, and then. Um, so I was six months, not having to think about very much. And then um, it sort of spiralled into kind of like the usual kind of like rock star depression, like who am I, what am I going to do next? You know, it's like Ed, Ed Wood and it. it's like, you know, am I good enough? <laughs> and it's like, um, maybe I don't have it anymore. And all those, all those second guessing yourself, you know, because you've got the time to kind of like, wallow in self-indulgence mm-hmm. so that was done it was all right it wasn't it wasn't really what I, how i wanted it to be um and then i just got the call from Sinead. Mm. that was 1990 so i went and did that for a couple of years and that was brilliant it was brilliant you know because you got to see the world again um at a high level you know no, no backs of vans, all first class and stuff. No sharing hotel rooms. No, no sharing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so, so and then and then of course you you do another record, Adam, which which was a great record, wasn't it? Which is a couple of years later, wasn't it? What did we do? Manners and physique. Well, what year was that? Was that night? That's about the same time, actually. Then there's, then there's Wonderful, isn't there? Which is a few yeah, years. Yeah, that was wonderful. Because Manners of Physique, I wasn't there. And they, he did it with Andre, who well, I like Andre. But <clears throat> I think his management at the time was trying to push him into this sort of R&B area, which he, he has no no affinity for at all. Mm. I have more affinity for it than he does. And mm. I just sort of listen to demos and stuff. It's not... It's all right. I mean, it's not bad. It's it's just not really you. I mean, it's, your vocals don't seem to fit. Your mm. voice isn't right for it. But, but obviously, as usual, I was ignored. Um, so I didn't have a lot to do that because due to being on the road with Sinead at that time, and I used to just fly in for the the odd weekend, you know, a couple of days off, and then I would fly to New York to work with Bernard. Bernard. Bernard Herriman. Bernard, Her- Bernard, what was his name? Bernard, Bernard Edwards. Mm. Mm. Which must have been an experience. Yeah, yeah. It was an experience. But I don't think, musically, we weren't on the same page. I mean, you know that what, what it's about. And it wasn't what we were about. Mm. Well, that, those songs are written by 30 people normally, aren't they? Yeah. Working separately. It's a completely different process, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's not it's not somebody just picking up a guitar and something appears up thin air. It's no. It's a production line. They, 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 they'd gone down that route before 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 they start they'd gone down that down that down that route in, with, with Adam in LA and he went to work with like Desmond Child. And you know that thing that you put you put your artists together with a top songwriter and hope you're gonna come out with one here. They didn't. Mm. It was awful. And um Thank God Adam knew it was awful and just didn't didn't proceed with it. And so he actually had most of the stuff with Andre. And I would come in and just finish things off. Yeah. The room at the top was like the three of us. Yeah. Me and Andre so came, up, came up with the track and everything. Which were, I thought, weird because it's the track that I think works the best on that album. Yeah, he's in it. Well, yeah, when well, it's up to the single as well, isn't it? Yeah. So I remember, yeah, that was good. Um, then what did we do? I don't, yeah, back to Wonderful. Wonderful was sort of like, 
that was a back to the roots sort of thing, you know, because it just, I wanted to write everything on acoustic guitar and everything could be played on acoustic guitar. There was no sort of, no million overdubs that you couldn't, you could do it. And we did do it. We did do it, you know, because it was the unplugged period, which I hated. I know I didn't understand what, why, why people got to go on MTV and do really naff versions of their hits with acoustic guitar. Why, why was crude? <laughs> And they're plugged in as well. That's always made me laugh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, like Rod, Rod Stewart and Ron Wood could do him Stay With Me on Acoustic Guitars. It was thought it's just, this it sounds like shit, mate. <laughs> but what was interesting about your record was it, it was it was a, quite a personal record, wasn't it? It was, you know, it, it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't songs like that, like soundtracks, you know, or, or or singing about other third person subjects. It wasn't it wasn't pirates and highwaymen. It was yeah. these are actually songs from the hearts, which is actually an interesting twist for Adam, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I don't know. It was just you know, it was just a different period in his life. Really, I think it was just reflective, and um, started thinking about himself even more in a different in a different way. Uh, yeah, it was supposed to be a grown-up record, but of course, nothing we do is grown-up. It's impossible. We can't do it. So um, <laughs> it's got some. I mean, I think Wonderful's good. It's got some good things in it. And Boz was on it. Mm. Mm. So there was some review that said that a brilliant guitar playing from Boz from Boz Boy. I said, "What about me, you twat?" And it's not. It wasn't there <laughs> most of the time. It's mostly me. <laughs> it must be interesting speaking to Boz because he's. He's like a younger version of you, isn't he? He's like... Well, he's not you... much younger. I wouldn't, call, I wouldn't call him Boz a young man. <laughs> but, is, I mean, what kind of conversations do you have with him about working in bands? I don't know. I don't it just sort of... He tells me about Morrissey, which sounds like a fucking nightmare. And... Um, I don't, I don't know. We don't. We, it's, it's something we don't talk about because we do it. You know, we've mm. always done it, so it's not like we have to talk about it. You know. So you talk about T Rex T Rex B sides and yeah, we do talk about yeah. T Rex B sides. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because he doesn't know all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he he's the uh, the big collector of T Rex. One, he? he is. He is. But uh, I found out he didn't know all the B sides. Oh wow, that's, yeah, that's a bit of a faux, faux pas, isn't it? That was a faux yeah. pas. Yeah, he almost, almost, yeah, he almost killed himself over that. Um, <laughs> um, no, I've gotten great with Buzz. He's one, one of my friends. I don't see him very often, but then I don't, don't see anyone very often. No, I don't think anybody sees anyone very often. But you, you, you also <laughs> added a layer on top of the pandemic by living in Derbyshire. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I did, I did go to London every weekend. Mm. So Escape, was, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Derbyshire thing hasn't worked out quite to um, my satisfaction, but never mind. Mm. It's, just another, it's just it's just another chapter in life. Just so. another chapter. Yeah. Just another chapter. But I had to try to find out, you know, do you want mm. to live in the country? Do you want to live in the big house in the country? No, I don't. Mm. So, so, and do you want do you want to be do you want to be married with a family? No. Like, <laughs> I mean, so kind, of, kind, of, kind of tied in with that is also um, you 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 start playing gigs again. You got back on the road after doing very very little stage work for like what twenty years. None. Yeah, none of them, that's no stage work at all. No. Normally, I meet you, you give me a, a five-minute tirade about how much you hate playing live, and then suddenly yeah. I see you, you're on stage with Shakespeare's sister doing a, a grand job, like like you've never not done it. Well, you know, it's, it, it is... How did that come about? <laughs> well, I was just forced to do it, wasn't I? It was just like, you, you're doing it, and, you know, how would you like to play with Shakespeare's sister? Oh, I don't know. Well, you're doing it anyway, so it's... Yeah. <laughs> And did that ignite a love of performing and touring? No. Uh, can, no, you, you're, you're I can, lying. I can, I, can, I can live without it, you know, if it's, if, it's, if it's the right. You know, Shakespeare says it's like, you know, it's Claire and Siobhan is all, you know, my, two of my best friends. And you think, well, this is, and we're all older now, so it's not going to be the uh, sniping backstage or, you know, it, it's just a reunion tour. I mean, I think thought it went, went really well. Although mm, yeah. I, I hadn't really ever listened to Shakespeare's sister, but there were some really good things. 
And Siobhan was brilliant. I was I mean, I was I never not I didn't really think she wasn't brilliant, but I was sort of like, wow, I never thought she was like this. Mm. Mm. I've never seen her do it before. I mean, what was the plan? Was the plan uh, to take take that any further? Yeah, well, the pandemic. Was, think, yeah. yeah, we were, we were going to go to Europe because we did a very short tour. It was only two weeks, but it it all worked, and I think it sort of sparked. You know, Siobhan was oh, I don't know this. This should I be doing this? You know, the, the normal thing that anybody has. And I think she really, really liked the experience. So I mean, I liked the experience. Um, I look, really liked the band. The band were great. It was it's strange playing to other people's audiences, though, <laughs> because you never know. I still don't know what the Shakespeare's or Shakespeare's sister's audience is. I mean, I know what Adam and the Ants' audience is because I've always sort of grew up with them, and I know what they're going to do. I know what they're going to say as well. Um, I mean, it, I don't know. You just kept looking. I mean, I, I do sort of overthink things, thinking, well, where does this fit? What is this? <laughs> what we are doing here. What, I, what am I doing here? Why am I doing it? I'm doing it because it seems like fun, really. Mm. And I think that's a good... Yeah, because you I don't... There's no strings attached, is it? No. It wasn't, there wasn't anything attached, which is really good. But it was a fairly simple tour. You know, had we taken it to Europe, I think it would have been really good. We still might, but I don't know, I don't know what the state of the world is anymore. Well, I think, yeah, I don't think a European tour is on the cards for, no, for about a year. No, no. We, might be, we might be able to get away British tours, though, soon. We so. might go away with another British tour, yeah, because it's been, it's been long enough and people are bored enough that they'll go to anything, won't they? They'll go to the opening of an envelope. Mm. Oh, yeah. I certainly would. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are you writing with, with them at the moment as well? You know, sending files backwards and forwards? And... No, they're not writing anything. They're not writing anything. I don't know what Sean's doing. I mean, she's moved back to London, so she's sort of busy with that. Getting the, I think she's just recently done it, like last month. So it's it's like she's just working on re-establishing her life back in London. Mm. Mm. But there's no talk about doing anything because no one knows what to talk about. We can't, no one can plan anything. 